Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Man, great show for you today. Ibrahim Mustafa joins us on Word Balloon. You might remember Ibrahim from his excellent work with Chris Sabella on a series called High Crimes. Monkey Brain released it digitally, and uh, it was up for an Eisner. Tremendous story. Great uh, crime story uh, set in the mountains. Ibrahim is back to talk to us about his new espionage thriller called Jaeger. Now, Jaeger is this creator-owned comic that he is doing through the new digital comics app uh, Stella or Stila. And uh, the first chapter is up there for free. You can also see a preview of Chapter 2 from the AV Club. And I'm going to uh, quote Oliver Sava over at the AV Club for the description on Jaeger. Set shortly after World War II, Jaeger follows French-Algerian spy Idris Morel as he hunts down escaped Nazis that forge their death certificates. And his official sanction mission ties in nicely with his personal goal of taking out the Nazis that tortured him when he was a prisoner of war. This is great stuff. I mean, this is a spy who came in for the cold. Uh, great foreign intrigue, as I like to, uh, I mean, everybody uses foreign intrigue. I don't know how often it's used in, in current uh, conversation, but that's essentially what we've got here. A great espionage story. It, it takes place uh, all over the world. Great globetrotting uh, stuff. And uh, Ibrahim has really uh, given a very cool style in terms of his art. And it's a great story. And it gives me and him an excuse to talk about some of our favorite spy stories over the years. Uh, and uh, we make recommendations of both uh, film and books, and I think you'll like it if you're a spy fan. This is a great story. Uh, he was kind enough to really give me the whole story uh, to, to get a sense for it. New chapters of Jaeger are released every Thursday through September 22nd on the Stella app. Uh, the first chapter, again, is free if you go to their website. Currently, um, uh, the Stella app is only for the iOS Apple system, but they are working on getting an Android as well. There are a lot of other stories at uh, Stella as well uh, that are available. So this is another uh, digital comic service that offers unique content, and uh, you can read as much as you want. Jaeger's just a great story, and I really wanted to give it uh, as much attention as it needed because it, it just knocked me out. And Ibrahim is really just one of these great creators to watch for. We also talk about uh, some of his other work that he's been doing recently for DC. Uh, He's been uh, pitching in at Dr. Fate with Paul Levitz, and he talks about what a trip that is for him. So uh, just a really good conversation about uh, spy stories and, of course, uh, the one particular spy story, Jaeger, from Ibrahim Mustafa on today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support through Patreon. Uh, That's the way you can subscribe to Word Balloon and help out the cause. If you think uh, what I do here is worthwhile and uh, you got a buck or two you can spare a month, Word Balloon is free. But if you want to help the cause out, it really does make a lot and it really makes a difference uh, when you subscribe to Word Balloon. Uh, And you can uh, get the information on that at uh, patreon.com slash wordballoon, or if you go to wordballoon.com and look at my website, there are ways to click through the Patreon information there. There's a Patreon ad on the front page and also a tab with a video, and it explains what I'm doing. So thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Again, as we're closing out uh, August, a lot of new subscribers this month. It really does mean a lot. And uh, in a sense, you're really helping me produce the show uh, through your contributions. Thank you again, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. And I'm going to do a search just to see if any Ibrahim Mustafa product is available at InStockTrades.com. You can get uh, the hardcover of High Crimes through Dark Horse. Again, Chris Sabella, Ibrahim Mustafa, a tremendous story. And uh, it is 45% off, $10.99. I'll give you the description on High Crimes if you're not aware of it. Disgraced Olympic snowboarder Zan Jensen runs a sideline business as a high-altitude grave robber. When a body is found at the summit of Mount Everest with a treasure of state secrets under its skin, Zan finds himself, Zan finds herself in the crosshairs of a government hit squad. As she faces the roof of the world, as she races to the roof of the world, Zan will navigate bullets and more in this treacherous but very exciting thriller. Uh, High crimes again, 45% off, $10.99. You can also get Black Panther, Trade Paperback Book 1, Tanisi Coates, and Brian Stelfreeze's excellent series. Uh, the first arc is collected now, 50% off. It's just $8.49. You can get Invincible Iron Man from Mike Deodato and Brian Bendis. Uh, this is Volume 2, War Machines, 
50% off, $12.49 for the hardcover. From Jason Aaron and R.M. Guerra, you can get Scalp, the deluxe edition. This is book five, and it is 50% off, just $14.99. Did you know that Scalp is being developed uh, into, I'm not sure if it's a film or a television show, but uh, the guy, and I forgive me, his name escapes me, but the guy who co-wrote the uh, Star Trek Beyond uh, script is actually developing that. And I think it is being developed for television, the more I talk about it. And uh, he also played Sulu's husband. Pretty cool, man. And he also did Dark Blue, the TNT television version of that Kurt Russell uh, excellent cop movie. It was a really good cop show as well, so I think Scalped is in good hands. But uh, enjoy the original story from Jason Aaron and R.M. Guerra. 50% off for Volume 5, $14.99. You can get Jessica Jones, trade paperback, Avenger, Brian Bendis, and a hell of a lot of various artists over the years. But these are the various uh, Jessica Jones stories that uh, also uh, crossed over uh, into Avengers World. Uh, It's 50% off for this trade. It's $9.99. Just a few of the books that are available now at InStockTrades.com. Check them out for yourself. There are great deals and great savings at InStockTrades.com. All right, without further ado, let's uh, pick up our conversation with Ibrahim Mustafa. Great conversation about spies, and I think you're going to enjoy it, and I know you're going to enjoy Jaeger. I can't recommend it enough. So uh, let's uh, talk to Ibrahim now on Word Balloon. Ibrahim Mustafa, I am so happy to have you back on Word Balloon. It's It's been far too long, but I think I wait when you do exceptional stuff it's not just the run of the mill yeah. stuff and and jaeger jaeger fits in that exceptional uh, category just like high crimes oh, but welcome back thank man. you sir i appreciate you having me back this is great so how did how did how did jaeger happen did was uh was this something you tailored for this because first of all formatically how can people get it uh so it's available on the stila app uh, which right now is exclusively to the iOS uh, system. Uh, so you okay. can get it on your iPhone and your iPad. They are working on an Android version as well that is supposed to debut this year. So, so Stila.com, and I, or you go to the you know the iPhone App Store and the iPad App Store, and you can get it. Correct, and it's uh, S T E L A, um, and they're at Reed Stila on Twitter. Very cool. Excellent. And so did, yeah, now did you submit this for this app? How did, how did this all happen? Well, uh, so Jim Gibbons, uh, who is the senior editor at Stila, uh, was, used to be a dark horse and he was the one who brought high crimes from monkey brain to print over a dark horse. So cool. yeah, when he got the new gig, uh, he reached out and said, Hey man, you know, we're doing some cool stuff. Uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about it. So then, you know, he said, Hey, you know, do you have anything to pitch? And, you know, I, being an artist, I was kind of like, oh, do you want me to find like a writer to work with or something? He's like, no, I like your storyteller, you know. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I had had the idea for Jaeger uh, kind of sitting in a drawer. I, you know, I, I tried to put a pitch together back in probably 2011, 2012, when I was still pretty green and, you know, did the blind submission thing. But it wasn't very well developed. So when the uh, opportunity to revisit it came up. I thought, you know what, let me dust this thing off and, and research it properly and, and, you know, see if it's, cause I, I felt like it had legs. So, uh, I sent it in and, and they greenlit it and I was off to the races. That's excellent, man. Are they offering other comics as well at Steeler? Yeah, they have a whole lot of stuff. They launched in February. Um, okay. so there's, uh, and it's cool. It, you know, it's kind of the Netflix model. So I believe it's nine ninety nine a month for an unlimited subscription. So you have, you know, the stuff that's coming out um, every week, like Jaeger drops on Thursdays, a new chapter every Thursday. Um, okay. And then there's something, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday as well. Um, and then once those are collected, they go into the catalog uh, and, you know, they something else rotates in uh, on, the, on the weekly release schedule. So there's a, I mean... I don't know the exact number, but there's a ton of stuff on there, um, and it's all you know, kind of one flat fee for for the whole library. Okay, and how um, how many installments uh, does Jaeger debut this week, or is it up and running, and we're getting the second uh, thing this yeah, week? Yeah, second second chapter drops. Um, let's see, I guess it'd be the twenty fourth. Um, okay, uh, which is Thursday, so it's new chapter every Thursday uh, for so the twenty fifth actually. Twenty fifth, thank you. Of August, we should probably say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's six chapters in total, 
Um, wow. And, yeah, so it, it, when all said and done, it's going to amount to you know, like a 48-page kind of prestige format length uh, story. Excellent. And you, yeah, you sent me the whole story. Yes, correct. Which was very kind. I appreciate that. No, it's great. I'm, dude, I'm a sucker for foreign intrigue. And even high crimes, I think, you know, fit that bill as well. But uh, especially putting it in uh, either World War II or the Cold War. And in this case, you know, you get that post World War II, early Cold War kind of action. Right. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total sucker for this kind of story. Is it Alan? I'm a big Alan First fan. You know, Alan First? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. You know, Chaikin told me about Alan first, and it's like, all right, if Howard Chaikin's telling you about sure, the yeah. foreign intrigue, you know, you, exactly, you listen, and this kind of fits. Tell, uh, tell people about uh, about the story of Jaeger, then the plot, yeah, as much as you want. Obviously. Sure, yeah, it's uh, so it's about a French Algerian spy uh, who was held prisoner in a Nazi uh, POW camp uh, mm -hmm. in World War II, and just to give a little bit of context. Um, after the war, you know, everybody was starting to worry about the Russians. And, you know, that was the, the beginning of the Cold War. And a yes. lot of Nazis escaped, you know, to South America and different parts of North Africa and other, across Europe. And the, uh, the effort to track down these war criminals was so minimal that uh, and they had such little funding and, and such small departments allocated to this that any time anybody had a, uh, a death certificate filed on their behalf, they just took them off the list completely. So a lot of guy, a lot of uh, you know, escaped Nazis were were falsifying their own death certificates to evade capture. So, yes. uh, so the main character in Jaeger, uh, you know, former POW, and uh, you know, he's just kind of on a on a revenge revenge spree. You know, he's disillusioned after. Uh, the special operations executive, which was sort of the, the espionage spy department precursor to MI6, uh, was dismantled when Prime Minister Attlee took over from Churchill. And so, you know, he's he's essentially left without a job and, and you know, he's got the scars from the camp and, uh, you know, the PTSD from it. So he's just kind of going around trying to hunt down whoever he can find and take them out. Yeah. Um, when uh, one of his uh, former colleagues from the SOE uh, approaches him and she says, you know, hey, I'm with MI6 now. We know what you're doing, you know, off the record kind of thing. There's a, a, a small, uh, you know, sanction, basically. We want you to be the guy to go around and find these uh, escapees who have, who we know to have falsified death certificates. So, and the whole time he's kind of looking for the, the you know, his sort of main persecutor, um, who he's not sure if he's alive or not. Um, and that's part of the, the, you know, journey for him is, is trying to track him down and, uh, you know, trying to, to come to grips with not turning into the same kind of monster that he's hunting, you know, cause at some point sure. you're just a killer just like them. Right. Absolutely. No, this is, uh, you know, marathon man. And you think of your, your really great, uh, like I said, that, that early, and you're saying it, the early, the early parts of the cold war, uh, and yeah, this kind of, you know, former Nazi hunting that was going on and stuff. No, it's fascinating. And uh, you've got a great cinematic style. I love your use of colors. Did you do everything for it? I did. Yeah. Everything but the lettering, which was Nate Picos or Blambot. And he, oh, very cool. And he was, uh, you know, honored to work with that guy. I mean, he's an industry veteran and he was just super great to work with and, you know, very accommodating, especially, you know, sort of my first time out the gate writing something and, you know, the steel of format uh, is a little different in terms of, um, you know, how many words you can fit in a panel. So, you know, he was interesting. No, yeah, please, because because you're right. This is, you know, panel to panel in that digital way that I do. You know, storytelling obviously is different. So please continue. Yeah. So uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, Stila, you know, because it's for the smartphones um, and the, the tablet, it essentially it's a it's a vertical. It's a continuous vertical scroll. So, you know, they very much set out to mimic, uh, you know, all of our day-to-day -day apps, your news articles, your Twitter, your Facebook, you know, you're just kind of thumbing up constantly. Um, and, you know, they, they saw the opening for uh, that in the industry as far as, you know, um, when we read regular digital comics, you're either going panel to panel and you're kind of pinching and zooming and that kind of thing, whereas Stila is, is a stationary width the whole way through. Um, mm -hmm. And you can play within those parameters, uh, which I tried to, to do, you know, to kind of work with the pacing and, and you know, some of the timing and the, the storytelling and whatnot. Um, 
So essentially, uh, every chapter is eight full comic pages. So it's very similar to like a Dark Horse Presents style of uh, anthology. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so that you know that that presented a lot of uh, really interesting uh, storytelling opportunities, as well as you know I had to really think outside the box, um, you know, because like a, a page wide panel uh, in a regular comic would not work in this sort of thing. So everything is kind of, you know, if you, if you were to picture a regular comic book page that is divided equally, uh, amongst four panels, that's essentially what a, what a Stila page would look like if it were in a traditional format. Yeah, it was, it was interesting though, because I, I did look at it both, um, from afar and appreciated the fact that it is, it's like a, a vertical comic strip. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the limited the limited space was interesting. I don't know. I, I'm fascinated because I think because of the fact that you do pay more attention to these uh, panel to panel as you read it and stuff. It it just feels longer than eight pages each time. It, each increment. It really does, you know. And and it's it's cool because you know when you're reading a traditional comic, you're sort of taking the entire page in at one time, and and you know it's up to you, the reader, to focus on an, a singular panel. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, the sort of uh, gestalt of it all kind of makes you maybe skip over things sometimes. And, you know, every now and then you go back, oh, did I miss something? And, you know. Yeah. Um, and with this, you, it's, you know, it's very focused kind of, you know, a lot of times it's one panel at a time, depending on yep. the size of that panel. I used, you know, some smaller ones, as everybody is doing with mm-hmm. Sila. But, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a different experience. And, you know, to be honest with you, John, I wasn't sure – how to feel about it when I heard about it. And then when Jim and I met up to talk about it, he showed me the beta on his phone and I was like, Oh, <laughs> this, this cool. works really well. Yeah. Yeah. It really, you know, and that's the thing. I think we forgot that as we went from smartphone to iPad yes. with digital comics and stuff, I think, I think because really, you know, at first I, I was worried too, even as a, as someone thinking about it. And, and as I was reading my first digital comics, I'm like, Oh, isn't this limiting? And don't you lose the impact of like a, a really cool splash page or something like that because you're dealing with real estate that's like the size of like a baseball card, you know? Right. So I, I wasn't sure, but now it's interesting, and I think you guys, you know, it, it, as you're thinking about it, you're obviously aware of that as well, and I think you, you know, conform to the the format and everything. And I I don't know, it goes, it doesn't. That problem doesn't seem to be there once you're actually reading it. Yeah, you know, uh, it was it was interesting to try to navigate it at first, uh, you know, just because I, you know, the language of comics that I speak is, you know, very much the traditional, you know, uh, page. So, you, you know, you have the ability to go from left to right all the way across if you want. Um, so that took a little bit of getting used to. But once I was in that groove, I found it, it was actually, I feel that it made me a stronger storyteller. I mean, between having to, to sort of troubleshoot and, and, you know, problem solve, okay, how am I going to convey this information within the space allotted? Um, and, you know, also kind of looking at the, um, you know, my art style in this, I, I, I went for something a little more pared down than I, I typically do on my regular work. Um, I was doing this in addition to like my regular monthly jobs. So, I wanted to make it manageable, especially since I was coloring my own uh, lion art on it. Um, so I actually worked pretty close to actual size with the phone screen. Um, and cool. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, you know, and I was really studying a lot of Alex Toth and Darwin Cook and, and Mignola and guys who really just, um, you know, have such a strong economy of line and, and can say so much with so few marks on the page. Um, and, and so I think... You know that I felt like that would lend itself better to the format, and it was also something I'd been wanting to try. And you know, the combination of working within the the uh, panel formats with the the Steel app, and also kind of trying that different style, I feel like made my other work better. So that was a really nice thing that I you know hadn't really anticipated. Before we start talking about some of the other projects you're working on, um, so as you say, this is going to be six chapters. In, in in the format and then after after steel is is done with it uh when like will you have an opportunity or will they produce uh 
a, a, a paper uh, version of this story? You know, as far as I know, they're they're in the digital only game. Um, okay. But, yeah. After a, a certain period of time, I can uh, take it to print. Um, so, and I actually, I you know, drew it in the regular format just because that's you know, again, it's sort of the language of comics that I speak. Um, so I. For the actual Stila app, I took all of the pages and, and cut them up in, in Photoshop and made them in the vertical format. So Okay, reformatted them. Yeah, yeah, so as it exists, it is in, the, in, in a printable format, which is cool. So I will have that opportunity later on, which I'm excited about. That's cool. Do you do you draw with uh, paper still, or do you use a Cintiq? Oh, I, what do you what do you use to draw? Well, you know, I do a combination of both. So I, I like a lot of uh, artists do. I I do my layouts digitally. Um, okay. And then I'll print those out onto the actual uh, paper and then go from there. So, yeah, I, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about digital as a, as a tool. And, you know, a lot of people are doing some really awesome things with it. For me personally, all of the things that I enjoy about creating, you know, a comic book page and, and black and white art, they're so inherent to the physical process and the way that the ink works on the paper and with the brush and all that. That I'll, okay. I'll, I'll probably be a, a forever holdout on the on the traditional format. So, what are the advantages then of uh, with the Cintiq? Is it like you, does it make it just faster to, to try and come up with breakdowns and everything? Exactly. Or? Yeah. If you're you know um, trying to a pose that you can't quite get right, you know you're not you're not digging into the paper with your graphite or your lead or whatever. <laughs> you know, it, it gives you a lot of you know if you need to resize something or. Um, you know, copy and paste maybe like the head because that was a great shape, but the body didn't work or whatever. Um, and also, you can do it in a lower enough resolution or just at a small enough size that it sort of prevents you from overworking it and noodling it in the stage where you really should just kind of be planning out what goes where versus actually doing a lot of the, you know, heavy drawing. Okay. Okay. Well, let's. Let's talk about some of your uh, your monthly things. What else are you working on these days? Well, you know, so after I finished High Crimes, I did a lot of bouncing around um, on fill-in stuff. I was kind of joking with a friend, actually. It sort of felt like I got out of a, a long-term relationship. And I was like, I'm just going to date around for a little bit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did uh, I did an issue of The Flash Season Zero um, tie-in comic. Oh, the dig that was a digital thing, absolutely. Yeah, um, I had to follow Phil Hester on that one, so that was yes, <laughs> that was a challenge because he's, you know, it's Phil Hester. Uh, and who was, writing, who was writing that? Uh, you know, the issue that I did was Sterling Gates. Um, oh, fantastic, Yeah, and sure. I, I think previous to that, all the other issues were one of the writers or producers from the show, I want to say. Okay. Um, and, you know, I've done a, I did a bunch of cover work. I did some uh, covers for Dr. Fate, when they when they relaunched that with Paul Levitz. Oh, excellent, Lou. Paul Levitz. Very cool. Um, some Escape from New York stuff. I did an issue of uh, Godzilla ah. and Hell, which was a lot of fun. Very cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, I did a, a few uh, fill-in issues on Dr. Fate. Um, and then uh, sort of in between those, I've been kind of developing, you know, Jaeger and, and another creator-owned thing. For down oh, the line, cool. and then uh, yeah, I just I just wrapped a, a couple months ago, I guess now an issue of Mockingbird over at Marvel. Oh, terrific! Uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And uh, who? Are, well, first of all, uh, with Doctor Fate, I want to know uh, what was it like working with Paul Levitz? Oh, it was great. I mean, you know, he's just such a, a consummate pro, right? I mean, sure. The the scripts were super tight, and you know, I just you get the sense when you read them that he just knew exactly what he wanted. And and put it out there in like one go. Like it didn't really. I don't know. Something about it didn't seem like it took a lot of tries. You know. Um, okay. Yeah, and it was just it was great, man. I mean, you know, it was sort of this love letter. Talk directly. Talk directly with him, and uh... yeah, yeah, we exchanged emails, and and then uh, Andy Curry was the editor uh, the first uh, go around, and he's he's a buddy, so that was great to get to work with him uh, finally. Great. And uh, yeah, you know, Paul was kind of writing this love letter to New York, so I got to. There's a lot of a lot of Google Street View uh, referencing, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the the cool thing about that is that uh, you know the character, uh, the new iteration of Doctor Fate is Egyptian American, and so am I. So yes. yeah, yeah, tell me, yeah, tell me about the character and everything, please. Yeah, so he's a half Egyptian med student um, in the book, and his father's from Egypt and his mother's American, um, which is 
exactly the well i'm not a med student but you know <laughs> um so yeah you know it was really cool i mean uh, you know representation in comics is something that that i think the industry is is working towards and a lot of creators are, are working pretty hard to make sure that it you know the uh the pages that they're producing is rep are representative of the world around them and you know as as a, a you know arab american you know i was born and raised here um you know, so uh, some of the some of the representations of Arabs, you know, in the media, I've never really identified with or felt like they applied to me just because, you know, I'm so inherently American. But, um, you know, you, when you kind of step away and remove yourself from it and look at it objectively, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, there's not a lot of it. So to have the opportunity to to, you know, work on a character that is essentially my same background was was pretty awesome <laughs> that's cool and had you ever been a, a dr fate fan i gotta tell you I'm, i've always been a dr fate fan uh i i think it's uh you know one of those classic golden age characters and i've really enjoyed the different turns they've made with the helmet and even even jared wasn't it jared stevens or whatever they made the helmet yeah, into a blade. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's really it is really cool that finally you know, we, we do have an Egyptian Dr. Faith. Yeah, no, it was really cool. And I, you know, my, my uh, experience with the character was pretty limited um, to, you know, like the Justice League of uh, United cartoon um, huh, and, you sure. know, a couple of Absolutely. tie ins or, you know, here or there. But uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I like to kind of go down the rabbit hole of research before I, you know, draw a particular character just, to, you know, even if it's just on it for a commission, just to kind of get a sense of who they are and, and their whole backstory. So I did kind of do a little deep dive and it's cool stuff. I, the, you know, the mystical characters didn't really grab me much as a kid, but as I get older, I start to really appreciate them more. So, um, that was, that was a, a, a lot of fun to get to do. And, you know, Paul, um, I think was, uh, really inspired by the Ditko, um, Dr. Strange stuff. So, and you can kind of see that in the visuals of the book, you know, and the stuff that he and Sonny had been doing. So, did a lot of research on that too, just to kind of get a feel for the the flavor they were going for, which is pretty fun. That's awesome, man. No, you know, and I uh, for uh, reaching back on Doctor Fade, Walt Simonson and uh, and Marty Pasco, yeah, did a did a really great you know backup feature for the Flash of all things. Uh, that also started with that first issue special. I'm sure you did your research. I you know I know I, I came across some of that stuff and uh, it was it was pretty awesome. I have to say. <laughs> No, that's cool, and it's cool that, that Paul's kind of nodded more towards that Doctor Strange thing, because I really did think that the two characters were unique, despite both being, you know, magic and stuff, and, and you know, the the onks and the way that uh, that uh, Marty and, and Walt uh, used the onks and everything seemed a lot different than the spell casting of, of Stephen Strange, but I, that's kind of cool, and it's a good choice to, I think, show that side of Doctor Fate in the, in the new version. Definitely. Very cool, man. Excellent. And then so and then so now you're working with Jaeger and everything. And what and what what else did you uh, do? You have some other things you're working. on? I do. Uh, it's one of those fun comics things where I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Which no problem. I know you hear all the time. So apologies. <laughs> no, no. Well, hey, when you seriously, when you're ready, please let me know, and and I'll have you back, and uh, we'll talk about some of the new stuff because. No, man, you're kicking ass. You're doing great. You've got High Crimes, uh, uh, something that people should reach back if they if they haven't already read it. Eisner nominated. Did you guys win for that, or was it just the nomination? Uh, no, we were nominated for Best New Series up against, like, Sex Criminals and, and a bunch of really stellar stuff. So we were yeah. we were honored to, to lose that one. <laughs> hey, man, no, seriously, you and Chris Sab uh, Sabella, those were that, – that's the first time I really saw both of your guys' stuff. And, uh, you know, and I remember meeting you back at uh, – and actually, I think I, did, I might have met you before uh, High Crimes. I know uh, at uh, Emerald yes, City. Yeah, that's right. Ago. Yeah. So yeah, no, no man, you've you, you've been you've been kicking ass ever since then, and uh, I'm I'm thrilled for you, man. And I, you know, did did High Crimes open doors for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was uh, one of the great things about that being digital first was that it was coming out as we were making it, um, whereas you know, two unknown quantities like Chris and myself. Uh, working on a you know a book like that would have been a, an OGN probably anywhere else. So you know it would have been the three years it took us to make it, and nobody would have seen it. So <laughs> until it was until it was out, uh, so that was really great, and it did help us both um, you know pick up some momentum and get our our foot firmly planted in the door for other work. So 
um, yeah, and you know, people are still discovering it, and you know, every now and then we get emails or or you know, people hitting us up on Twitter talking about it. So yeah, it's it's I'm we're both really proud of that, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm glad it's uh, on the shelf now. And that, of course, was uh, from Monkey Brain, and that's uh, Chris Robertson and Allison. And I, right now, damn it, because uh, I always think of Chris and Allison as a couple, and I'm forgetting Allison's last name oh, professionally. Baker. Allison Baker, of course. And uh, yeah, I man, uh, I I love that imprint, and in particular, High Crimes was really one of the stories that stood out for me. Is it uh, in in print from IDW? Uh, Dark Horse, actually. Oh, Dark yeah, Horse. Yeah, they okay. gave us a really beautiful hardcover of it. Um, just we were both blown away and it was weird too you know because it was digital first so when we got the the proof of it it was just this big thick heavy you know you could knock somebody out with it and we were like whoa <laughs> yeah you know because it's it it was i mean i certainly ha- had the stack of you know pages next to my desk to to you know see kind of how big it was going to be but you know once it was actually in that like physical printed book form it was like well look at that <laughs> <laughs> No, that's excellent, man. Well, and forgive me, as you said, because you said it earlier that uh, your Steel of Connection was your your dark horse editor, right? For uh, for high crimes as well. That's excellent, man. Very cool. Is um, all right. And now you know you've you've done Jaeger and stuff. So I mean, did that kind of uh, make you think more? I, I don't. And you don't have to tell me whether the thing that's coming up is just you or if you're if you're working with somebody else on it but you know i mean are you are you thinking more along the lines after jaeger of uh, doing more of your own stuff solo i would like to yeah um I'm, you know i'm trying to figure out if it's going to be the type of thing that i want to try to do you know kind of for myself on the side um or pursue more as like a regular thing you know i one of my favorite parts about comics is the collaborative aspect of it so you know, sure. when you're kicking back and forth ideas with, you know, the writer you're working with and, every you know, you're both getting excited. It kind of serves as this, like, you know, mutual inspiration thing. So, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I have a couple things, you know, in the back of my mind that I've kind of been thinking about for a while. And I have a sort of a thematic um, follow up to Jaeger that I would like to do um, at some point. So, uh, yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, maybe, you know, start off with some co-writing or something to kind of uh, get dip my foot in the pond a little bit more but uh it it is you know it's one of it's funny because you know i there's so many amazing writers in this industry and so many Mm -hmm. that i want to work with that it's it's like well you know (laughs) i mean i've I've only begun to scratch the surface of awesome people that i want to work with so yeah probably a little bit of both i would say very cool and you know i meant to mention it earlier because i've talked about it on other shows um are you reading or have you read uh, victor santos's Polar oh, books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are great. Oh, fantastic stuff. Actually, Jim Gibbons was the editor who brought that to Dark Horse, too, I believe. Wow. Um, well, that's cool because I really do think thematically, you know, you could put uh, Jaeger right next to the Polar books, definitely. Oh, thank you, man. That's a that's a big compliment because those are fantastic. The new one just came out, I believe. I haven't picked that one up yet. Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, volume three. Yeah, I got to grab that. No, amazing stuff. Yeah, all three volumes are just Again, excellent foreign intrigue, and and again, that's why I got really excited about Jaeger because I had literally just read um, the second volume, and I've got the third one sitting there. I haven't had a chance to read it yet for Polar, but uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I, I'm I'm glad that comics is finding room for uh, you know all all genres, and it just seems like foreign intrigue. It, it surprises me how little there is out there. So it's nice that. You know, uh, Dynamite's doing the new James Bond series. Oh, yeah. And and Santos is, you know, getting these polar books out there. And I don't even know how old those polar books are, frankly. You know, I don't either because uh, it's a web thing, right? It's a web comic that he does. Didn't even know that. I, I just, you know, I remember his name from uh, his collaboration with Azzarello on, I want to say, wasn't it called Filthy Rich? It was one of those Vertigo oh, crime right. graphic novels. I didn't realize that was him. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that was the first one, wasn't it? Yes, it yeah, was. That was Absolutely. a great book. The car salesman and the yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was more a straight up crime uh, story, and that's you know, but visually, yeah, I mean, that's that's where that's where I saw him. And then when I read about Polar, it's like, oh my god, this is you know, Cold War. It felt like Cold War espionage. Yeah, and I'm like, that's fantastic. And again, I think you have that globetrotting aspect of it because of the nature of the story, it being you know, hunting down the Nazi war criminals and stuff. I'm just like I said. I just really think foreign intrigue got going in the '30s, and we got some really cool stories 
And um, I don't know. I think um, I think somewhere in the eighties, it just got lost. Uh, John Glenn, I think, the Bond uh, director of those uh, Timothy Dalton movies. I don't know. It just it, something happened along the way in the eighties, and it wasn't as much fun. Yeah, you, and uh, you know, the Bourne movies, I think, are bringing that back a bit. They are, and you know, I, the uh, I mean, the Daniel Craig Bond movies too were were. I agree. Yeah, I mean, such especially like Skyfall was so beautifully shot. Was that uh, Roger? Roger Deakins, the director of photography on that. Oh, I'll go with you on that. I, I don't remember who the DP was on that. That's fantastic, yeah, it's just, though. Yeah. I mean, it's like the prettiest movie I've ever seen. I swear. It's so beautifully shot. And, like, you know, it, it, it takes all of these cool locations and just makes them look so vivid and, and sort of romanticizes them. And, you know, they always – I love those uh, the sort of, like, um, caption or, or sort of title card type of thing they do when, you know, it'll say, like – whatever city they're in, you know, like Rome, Italy, you know, Oh <laughs> yeah, man, those, you know, the, you know, and I, I, you're, you're, a, you're a big Bond fan as well. Yeah, absolutely, man. Who's your guy? You know, I gotta be honest because I was a little kid when ABC would show the Conneries yeah. on, on Sunday nights. In fact, and I, and I've said this on other word balloon episodes, the first two, uh, the first time I saw um, Goldfinger and I think it was Dr. No, were on black and white televisions, and it didn't. It was like a couple of years after first seeing it on black and white that I saw them in color, and was like, "Oh, these are color." Yeah. Movies. Even <laughs> but you're right. You know those those. Uh, and so yeah. So it's it's Connery for me. And in that same way that you were just saying about uh, the, the DP for the Craig films, um, those are, those first six Bond movies, and I'll throw Lazenby in there as well. They were such world travel logs. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I grew up in the early '70s, so. For me, it was still exciting, and it really was this open door to the rest of the world. And it just, I mean, you know, the scope was amazing. And now you look, and uh, sometimes you you unfortunately see some of the things they had to do. Like I know in Goldfinger, some of the shots at the Fountain Blue in, in Miami and stuff, it literally is a photograph yeah, the, of the, <laughs> the hotel. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, there's a lot of charm in those, though. I I, yeah. I recently got the you know the big Blu-ray set of them, nice. and uh, I, it's great. I mean, the the restoration on those things is absolutely stunning, and you know, to watch a movie from you know what 1963 and in Blu-ray yeah. high def, it just looks <laughs> fantastic. And they you know in the special features they show you they do the the swipe. You know, and you see the grainy, dirty, dusty version. It looks kind of like a, kind of like a Zack Snyder movie, and then it sort of wipes left to right, and you get this vivid color. Um, yeah, you know, those. I, I feel like those hold up pretty well. I mean, you know, you can tell a lot of it's on sets and everything, but I, I still think Doctor No is just fantastic. I mean, oh, it's fun. It's just yeah, it's it's. An, I mean, and unfortunately, a little insensitive from a racial standpoint. Sure. I mean, some of these movies, yeah, they just don't wear well that way. Um, but yeah, I, I you know, from Russia with Love, I think is is my favorite because I think Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw, man, that train fight scene for the yes. for the time that what was that movie sixty five? No, so? it was well, well, Gulf, Doctor No was sixty one. Oh, so, and oh, I that's think right. it was like sixty two or sixty three okay. for uh, for uh, Russia with Love, the second movie. Yeah, and that you know, I mean, I don't have a a ton of experience with movies from that era, but it seems to me like that a, a fight scene like that. Uh, that level of just being so visceral and, and intimate was probably unlike anything that had come before it to that point. I mean, you know, the close quarters yeah. of that train car, it's just fantastic. Well, and Peter Hunt, who ended up directing uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, was the, the film editor right. on, a, on a few of those. And I can't remember if that was Terrence Young for the second movie. I think it still I was. Think it, well, yeah, I think he did at least the first three i want to say um yeah because I, I know guy hamilton i can't remember if guy hamilton came in on thunderball or goldfinger but yeah i was gonna say so yeah that's the thing it seemed like philip hunt or, or rather uh, peter hunt was terrence young's guy when it came to editing and yeah it's just it's so you're right that train scene is so spectacular and also um and i love the gadgets i i do i really do love the gadgets of Bob. Yeah. but this is really the most straight up cold world espionage just a man in his fists. I mean, there there weren't the gadgets that that were to come, you know, from Goldfinger on. Right. Yeah. So so that's that's another reason why I really love From Russia with Love. Yeah. The 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 briefcase with the. That's yeah. True. What is it? The, 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 <laughs> the gold sovereigns and the knife and the you know oh, it's so good, man. 
I, you know, it's funny. So I guess Daniel Craig is probably most people's, you know, just because he's it, amazing. Oh, he, I mean, he, it, you almost can't count him among them because it's a, it's a completely different thing. I mean, he really came in and just, you know, made that character his own and sort of revitalized it. And, You're right. And Casino yeah. Royale, I mean, I, it's a perfect film. Like I, I've tried to, to break that thing apart and you just can't. Well, and it's just heartbreaking too. I oh. mean, you know, I, you know, I buy it. Absolutely, and Eva, Eva Green is absolutely wonderful, and it's so funny how she's been the bad girl in so many films since then. Yeah, and it's just like she is so great as Vesper, and it's just like, oh, you know, I heartbreak. Yeah, it it that one hits me, man. I got to tell you, like I, <laughs> I, you know, I watched the the Bond movies like Comfort Food and Attaboy. and the, <laughs> that one I have to kind of psych myself up for because the ending is just so brutal and so heartbreaking. And they, I mean, they sold that relationship so well in that movie. Yeah. You yeah. know, you really believe that they, you know, fell for each other in such a way that, you know, especially Vesper didn't want to. And then you find out why, and it's just, Oh yeah. And well, yeah. you know, I mean, he's, he's spectacular. My, I, I have, I'm of the very unpopular opinion that I think Timothy Dalton was an excellent Bond, and he's my favorite pre-Daniel Craig Bond. I, that's okay, because he was... A, I, I like... Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I always say I'm, I'm Father Flanagan when it comes to uh, the James Bond movies, if you know the movie Boys Town, because the motto of Boys Town is there's no such thing as a bad boy. There you go. And, and, <laughs> and I think there's there has not been a bad James Bond, and I include Lace and B in there. And I, I think he, he definitely was maybe the weakest actor... But he was surrounded by the best film. And I think 180 degrees of that was Timothy Dalton was an excellent James Bond that was underserved by his directors and screenwriters because I think they felt the political uh, correctness of its time that all of a sudden it was like, you know, James Bond can't hop from bed to bed anymore. Right. And, and, and also, again, they, they kept cutting the budgets. You learn that from some of the making of documentaries on the, on the Blu-rays. And um, – yeah, I, I just, like I said earlier about John Glenn, I think uh, he was a great first unit director director or second unit director, not a great lead director. Yeah, and you know, the other thing about those movies is that by that point, they had exhausted all of the Fleming novels and were going into the short stories. So, True. you know, uh, The Living Daylights was a, a very short, you know, just, it, was, it was simply Bond taking out the cellist. Uh, or, or, you know, at least that was the mission in the story. Yeah, yeah. And then they built all this other stuff around it. And I believe that was when Michael G. Wilson started, uh, write, you know, co-writing those movies. Um, so, you know, I think he was kind of getting his beak wet with it. And, and you know, you also had, I mean, that was, what, 85 when... Uh, when the Big Day Yeah, was. and, you know, you've got... Like 87 or something. Yeah, and at that point, you know, what, uh, Predator and all these other crazy action movies that are, are just, you know, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what was out at that point, but you know, things were, the, the tone was changing yeah. and there wasn't really the room for the, you know, your dad's, uh, bell bottom James Bond anymore. Right. So they, <laughs> they kind of had to figure out, you know, some different stuff. And I, and I think it, I think it worked really well. And I also liked the, um, the sort of, you know, modern take we we see this every era with with different characters as they get you know rebooted like what what nolan did with batman right so things start to have different explanations for why they exist or you know you get to see someone else's cool newer take through through the you know more modern lens of these characters True. and and that's that's one of the most enjoyable aspects of those movies for me too um so you know, seeing the the cool, I love that '85 Aston Martin that he's got in the Living Daylights. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I mean, it's definitely corny in some ways, but I I feel like it was a pretty solid Bond story. Um, oh, no, uh, well, and I know again through his interviews and stuff, he he loved the Fleming books. He wanted to basically do what Craig did in terms yeah. of, uh, um, yeah, making it more true to the the Fleming stories and. Um, yeah, like I said, I think his read was right. I think he was underserved. I think Pierce Brosnan was kind of underserved with a few exceptions. I think GoldenEye and Tomorrow Never Dies were his two best movies. God, you know, Die Another Day, I love the first third of it. Yeah. And, and I liked that Halle Berry was in the movie, but as soon as she appears, that's when the movie stops being interesting to me. Yeah. I loved, I loved the Korea stuff. 
Yeah. And I loved him being uh, suddenly not in the in the favor of, of the British government and M basic, basically saying, we had to give up too much to get you back. We're not happy with, yeah. you know, having you yeah. back, basically. And him escaping and getting to Hong Kong, that was that was all really, really interesting. And then it just, you know, I, and I even liked the, the, the twist of the villain in Die Another right. Day. But really, it was just, all right, laser. Yeah. Solar laser. <laughs> and it's like, all right, man, that was kind of creaky, you know, going back to your own, you only live twice. But okay, you know, it's, you shrug. You know, you know. my favorite uh, Brosnan one is The World Is Not Enough. I think. Really? Tell me why. Well, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, it's the least corny of all of them. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's. Despite, despite having Denise Richards well, as. Uh, the, exactly. Or whatever yeah, that's was. the thing about that movie, John, is that people just remember that she was in it. They go, ah, you know, because she's terrible. In it. She's absolutely terrible. Oh, but, yeah. No, and you know, I'll even, you're right, though, because what's the French, uh, Sophia? Oh, God. I, you know, I always blank on yeah. her name. Uh, but she, you know, she was interesting, and it was kind of cool seeing a Bond girl twist into into the villain. Exactly. You know, um, there, there are a lot of parallels to another, you know, a movie that I feel was unjustly maligned, which The Dark Knight Rises. You know, you have the the shaved-headed, uh, you know, guy who you think is the villain and he can't feel pain. And then it turns out he's just kind of the, the glorified henchman for the, the female, uh, you know, lead villain. Right, Talia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I think I think that movie does a lot of good things, and I think overall it's the most solid of them. Uh, but you know, that's my particular taste. I mean, that's cool, man. I think I think Golden is a great movie, but you know, and Sean Bean is fantastic in it, and, and Sean Bean's really good in it. Yeah, and, but you know, it's got that like really crappy like '90s synth music that pops up at <laughs> weird times, and. You know, I think I think they didn't they didn't know what kind of tone they wanted to go for, so it was like, you know, uh, half, uh, you know, under siege and half like Roger Moore, live and let die type of you know wonky. That's fair. So yeah, I think I I feel like they kind of figured it out a little bit more by the world is not enough, and I think like uh, you know, um, tomorrow never dies. I, the the villain. In that one, I like that actor a lot, but I thought he was a little. Jonathan Price. Yeah, he was just a little cartoony for for even for you know a Bond movie in my <laughs> personal. Well, and you know. it, it was kind of a missed opportunity because he was sort of a Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. Knowing what we know now in the information age, it it again, it's like that's a kind of movie that they should almost go back and fix. And whoever you know, if if it's more Craig or whoever follows Craig, I almost think you could remake. Tomorrow Never Dies into a better, more interesting movie and a much more insidious villain. Yeah. Uh, given the ability to manipulate the media and and do a lot more, because you're right, it was it was a very modern take, but really underneath it, it was just another maniacal Bond villain that you know again kind of felt like you know a Roger Moore kind of Bond villain. Yeah, and you know I'm really curious to see what they do next because Casino Royale was. You know the the post nine eleven post born identity take on Bond, right? They kind of like look, we can't do this corny stuff anymore. It's got to be you know serious, and I think they hit the perfect tone with those. And you know, Craig is going to be a tough act to follow. You know, presuming that he is done. So I wonder. You know, I've, I've heard some people say that it would be cool if they went back in time and did more like a period uh, movie, which I would be you know, pretty interested. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, and I think sometimes that it, it would be better to, you know, kind of relate to these characters in the period in which they were created because they work best in those environments. So, you know, I, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I, you know, I, well, this is good. I want to continue to explore other Bond things. Have you, have you read the comic strips? Yeah. Yeah. I got the uh, collections a while back that are, um, you know, they grouped together like Casino Royale, Mm -hmm. uh, live and let die moonraker and then, so they were doing them in, in order of the the book releases i guess and i think those yeah, were in so, the 50s right when they were uh I, you know they well i know they started before dr no and it is kind of crazy and i don't know if specifically saltzman and, and broccoli looked at connery and said well you know he kind of looks like the comic strip because the comic strip did predate uh dr no oh and, that's just, and, yeah i never thought about that but it, and, it totally and yeah, looks I mean, like that, connery he really, yeah. There's a very strong. It's John uh, Horak, I think. 
H O. Oh, you know, Horik was one of the. I think McCluskey was before Horik. That's right. That's but, right. But yeah, McC I think John McCluskey was first, and then Jan I want to say Yannick Horik. Yeah, and I feel but like I, could be wrong. I feel like Horix was the one that looked the most like Connery, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, but even McCluskey had that. You know, there's there's definitely it leans towards that kind of you know classic Scottish tall, dark Connery look. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I, no, you're right. McCluskey's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm flipping through it right now. and Absolutely. Okay. That's crazy. What a what a likeness to Connery there without even... Wow. Yeah, so I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know if that he was cast with the comic strip in mind or not. It was cool. Uh, Q, Desmond Llewellyn, had said that he was... Uh, he's like, I never read the novels, but I was a huge fan of the comic strip. God bless and, you know, that yeah, guy, is, huh? Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Well, you know, that was back in that time when I'm a big comic strip adventure, news, newspaper adventure fan as well. Have you read uh, Secret Agent Corrigan? No, you know, that and, uh, oh, what's that other one that was, uh, I think it might have been a syndicated strip. And they do these, I believe IDW did the big collections of them. Uh, Rip Kirby? Oh, uh, John Sable, Freelance. Is that what I'm thinking of? Oh, you know, John Sable was uh, Mike, Mike Wells' character oh, from the 80s. That's right. No, I'm thinking... And that's that. a great series. No, I love that series. That's an excellent series. And I did pick up uh, Mike Grell's James Bond run recently, and I haven't been able yes. to get through it yet, but it looks fantastic. Oh, I remember when that was coming out, man. Yeah, that was that was very cool. Uh, but there was... No, he's got that kind of style. There was one that was... Uh, some something X nine I want to say or I feel like yeah you know that's that became uh, Corrigan oh, Secret okay. Agent X nine okay. and yeah Dashiell Hammett when he first created the character with Alex Raymond it was Secret Agent X nine and then finally I don't know if it was in the sixties or whatever that they turned they changed it to Secret Agent Corrigan and uh, Archie Goodman wrote it and uh, right now I can't remember who drew it but IDW you're right yeah. it was, uh, was those things no those are great I'm a big Milton Kniff uh, fan of Steve Canyon and. Terry and the Pirates was great, but I, I'm a, I have to admit I'm a Steve Canyon fan as well because, again, that was more Soldier of Fortune for an intrigue. Yeah, and, you know, I, I live in Portland, as you know, with half uh -huh. the comics industry. And, <laughs> you know, we have Powell's Books here, which is a great, you know, it's like a, a, an entire square city block of used books and new books and stuff. And and I, I, you know, they have a bunch of those there and I keep salivating over them. I just haven't pulled the trigger on them yet because – you know, that's one of the things about making comics is the, the time to read them dwindles so much that, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you, I gotta, I gotta dig into those. Toth? Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned Toth is one of your, uh, your examples and stuff. Yeah. What, what older artists do you look at in terms of style? Um, you know, uh, Toth, Topi is another guy who, uh, you know, is just one of those evergreens, um, you know, a lot of people who I honestly can't really name it, that are collected in stuff like that, that you just kind of, you know, um, stumble on. Yeah. And I mean, you know, definitely the, the it, it, there's a cool thing with, with comics art. And you, when you sort of discover uh, the lineage of these artists, you know, you look at, you look, it, it's kind of like when you meet a friend's parents and you're like, Oh, I, okay. You look like both your parents combined. Right. Like, <laughs> You know, you figure out, like, oh, I love Chris Somney's work. Like, oh, well, he's a big, you know, Toth fan, a big Kniff fan. Yep. And you kind of yep. reverse engineer from there. And that's that's always a lot of fun. So, you know, those rabbit holes are infinite, it seems like. But uh, Have you had, have you talked to Chris a lot? No, you know, I don't actually know him. Um, I, I, He lived in Portland for a while, and then uh, I, I think he moved before I... Yeah, he moved back. Yeah, yeah he moved back, to, back, moved back to St. Louis. I know that uh, I think uh, when they started having kids, they wanted him close to their grandparents. So that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, they moved back. I haven't talked to him in a while. Great guy. He seems and, seems uh, super nice, and he's just, I mean, the guy is, he's inhuman with how good he is. I love it. He's killing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's killing it. No, I'm really proud of him and uh, really happy that he and Wade are having such a wonderful collaboration. And, I, you know, the the proof is in the yeah, world. Well, I loved when he was with Bendis, too, for that. Man. Yeah, and, you know, talk about another great espionage, you know, foreign intrigue style book with uh, Black Widow right now, what they're doing Absolutely. together. Absolutely. No question. I noticed Modesty Blaze, actually a, a, a Word Balloon listener, is like, hey, man, uh, the original Modesty Blaze movie is coming back on uh, on Blu-ray and Monica Vitti. You know, that's one I've heard you mention on the show before, and I, I I never remember to look it up until I hear you mention it again. I'm like, oh, I got to do that, and then the cycle continues. <laughs> you know, check out those – yeah, check out those comic strips because I'm, I'm reasonably certain Titan still has the license on those, and I would imagine – if you're going to Powell's and finding Steve Canyons, you might be able to find uh, uh, there or at Amazon or whatever, finding because they, they were collecting the Mosley Blaze uh, 
comic strips. Kelly Sue DeConnick can tell you all you want to know about that stuff. Yeah, you know, Titan, uh, they're the ones who put out those uh, Bond collections, too. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and it's the same format and everything. And Peter, and I forget the name of the artist, the creator of Modesty Blaze, that's, you know, it's just cool stuff. Did you ever dip as a, as a Secret Agent fan, as you are, and as a Bond fan? See, growing up, watch, and again, in that uh, early vcr period even before the vcr period when you know you were stuck with whatever was on tv right. all those mad helm movies and and flint uh james coburn as flint and everything all those uh, knockoff bond 60s spy movies and stuff i gotta be honest i loved them almost as much as i like the bond yeah movies. anything you know and, it's, and man from uncle and get smart i was a huge get oh, smart me fan too. That, that was syndicated on nick at night when i was younger <laughs> i used to watch that all the time the the concept of having a shoe that was also a phone blew my mind. And of course, now, you know, anything could be a phone. I mean, you know, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you know, I was anytime anything had a car that was, you know, tricked out in any way. And I think that fascination probably started with the 66 Batmobile. Um, sure. But, you know, the I, there was some of that in Get Smart, right? They had car gadgets and stuff. And then. Well, and he had just you know the cool uh, the the three the three cars the red car the blue car I just remember the gold one being of the Corvette. That's right, yeah. But I, but I can't remember the makes of the of the first two cars. But they yeah no they looked they were sharp and you know God the the man from Uncle's uh, car was some silver beautiful crazy. Yeah. Did you see job. the the new movie that they did? The I did. I liked it. I, I, I liked really it. enjoyed it, man. I thought it was a solid movie. Guy Ritchie, man. you know I, I I'm I'm happy he kind of found his groove again. I felt bad, though, because, you know, the movie really didn't find its audience until it was on Blu-ray and on cable yeah. and everything, and then people really discovered it. But, uh, no, I... it in, in the best way, it wasn't the television show. And it, and it was kind of its own just Cold War thing, and I, and I think that was... I'm, I'm glad they did that, because you, you can't recapture that formula. I The first season of Uncle holds up for me, because it is straight-up adventure. Unfortunately, it came during the 66 Batman show when every genre show tried to be the 66 Batman sure. show. Literally from Lost in Space to Uncle to even, you know, a bit of the Wild Wild West. You know, yeah. I mean, they all kind of like their little kitschy kind of silliness to them. And and Uncle just got way, way too silly. Where did, and that's too uh, where did Steed and Mrs. Peel fall into that? Well, that was awesome because, you know, that was unaffected by the Batman craze and the the Avengers was its own thing. Yeah. And it was so – it was so – those two shows, the Avengers and also for Roger Moore fans and, you know, God, what did – you know, what did people look at? You know, why did they like Roger Moore so much as Bond? And it's like because we loved him as the Saint because the Saint and, and – the Saint was more straight up action. Now, was that Avengers what that Val Kilmer movie was based on? Yes, yeah, sadly. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, see, I got to go back and find that show now. It's it's a great action show, and seriously, Moore was so much better and more Bondish as Simon Templar than he was. I mean, it it got silly fun with and and I like the you know hey Spy Who Loved Me is a great movie. I like Live and Let Die. That's the first Bond movie I saw in the movie theaters, and it and it feels like an Agent of Shield movie, he, and he's almost dressed like Nick Fury and has kind of a, oh, a shield like yeah. in live and let die. You know, it's so funny how how nostalgia plays into it too. Like the thing that the first one you saw is the one that is like, ah, oh, you know. Well, yeah, what was your first Bond movie in the theater? Uh, I think it was probably Goldeneye. Okay. Um, but you know, back the I don't know if it was TBS or or what the station was back then, but they used to do the whole, you know, like 30 days of Bond when the yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just glued to those, man. That's how I, you know, so so Connery, fortunately, I discovered his stuff pretty early on in, in my relationship with Bond or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, a lot of times people <laughs> sort of go back and find it. But I was lucky enough to kind of have them simultaneously because they would always, you know, do those those marathons whenever the new movie was coming out. So it was kind oh, of yeah. perfect timing. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you've noticed or if you have cable currently, but uh, Encore this month has been doing uh, Bond runs. Oh, no need, my friend. I've got the Blu-ray. Uh... <laughs> oh, <that's true. laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know when they come on, I will like stop for a couple of minutes and oh, watch yeah. like a couple of my favorites and stuff. I've, I've and, seen yeah. the the probably se se last hour of the Shawshank Redemption, even though I own it so many times <laughs> because you just it's always right at the same part when you you're flipping channels and then like how do you how do you change it after that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, there's another, did you ever watch that show? Am I, was it called MI5 or Spooks? I or? loved MI5. Yes. It's, it was called Spooks in Europe and in England where it was originated. It was MI5 here in the States. Did you see the new the movie they made after the series was over? Well, I tell you, that's what I saw, and then I went, "Holy shit! I need to watch this show because I didn't realize they were connected." I love that movie, man. I thought, oh yeah, I thought it was great. I, you know, it was it was it was very meat and potatoes in terms of, you know, the the spy stuff and the intrigue. And I, I mean, I just eat it up, man. I, it was it it touched on all of the hit all the buttons for me, you know. Oh, I completely agree. I, I, I've been raised, honestly, when I discovered MI5 in its first season, I became a huge fan. A&E showed it on, on uh, American cable. And somewhere in the fourth season, they just stopped showing it. And it really drove me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll even confess to uh, illegally downloading seasons. And I ended up buying them, so I feel like I've, I've redeemed myself. Sure, yeah. But, but I was like, you can't cut me off. I, I know there is still more coming. And it was only in the middle of the fourth season. And it ran ten seasons. Oh, did it? Oh, yeah. Okay. It was huge. And it's um, – for people who haven't seen it, um, I, for, oh, I forget the actor's name that plays Harry Pierce, the spy master. He's the constant throughout the ten seasons. And, and it really becomes more his story. Certainly is in the movie as well. Now, it, and and is he actor, the one who's uh, uh, Jon Snow's kind of – contact go-to guy in the in the movie yes. okay yeah, that's right he's Jon Snow. that's right you know i thought he was great in that yeah i mean terrific. i think game of thrones was his first thing right so you you know most people 99 percent right. of the world only knows him from that so you know seeing him step out of that and and actually i mean he, he was great with the action stuff and you know i bought yes. the character and it was i didn't feel shoehorned in just to have you know kit harrington in it i thought it was great no, and that's the thing. It is. It is this really great cast. Um, and the guy. And I'm. I'm blanking on his name. I have to look it up. It's. It. it no, it's not Colin Firth. That's. Uh, that's Kingsman. Um, but I'll look it up. Harry Pierce. Um, it's the guy. The actor also plays um, the political officer at the very beginning of Hunt for Red October, who Connery kills. Oh. It's not under the Soviet eye yeah. when he's defecting and everything. And he's literally only in like, you know, the first 10 minutes of Hunt for Red October. But this role, and I mean, you get a, you get a bit of it in the film, in the, uh, in the MI5 film. And it's called, I think, Spooks the Greater Good is the European title of the film. Okay. Uh, and, I don't, and I know it's just MI5. Uh, uh, I know that's what HBO lists it right. as, the film itself. But in the series... Uh, obviously, as most television series, I mean, he is the constant, and his character arc is just incredible. So, and it's and it, you know, really, I mean, the the last few years really focuses as much on him, the spy master, as it does his agents in the field, and they're not afraid to kill off characters. The original three agents by the end of season two, I want to say, are either dead or drummed out of the business and you can discover on your own what happens to each character and they go through agents that die in the field and it's you know that that are the leads for several years and stuff it's it's an amazing series it really is a great series and it it's a very modern look at espionage because it i think it was created in the wake of 9 11 yeah so and, you know i feel like it was on netflix for a while and and it was. and i would see it as i was thumbing through and i I, you know, it was in my list for the longest time and I just never got around to it, but I'm glad I didn't because I feel like I'm in a, a better position to appreciate it now more than I would have then. And, you know, it's always nice too, when you find a show that had that kind of lengthy run that wasn't affected by the American writer's strike. <laughs> you know? Yes. Now, was it, would you say it was consistently good the whole way through or were there any kind of seasons that you were like, ah, you know, season four was kind of whatever, but five redeemed it or any of that kind of thing i i really i really enjoyed it throughout and maybe because like i said i was so hooked for those first you know f four seasons uh that i'm like oh no i need more yeah so peter, it's not it's not colin firth it's actually peter firth that's right who plays who plays harry pierce and yeah like you said john snow kid harrington and it's uh the film the film is a great way to decide whether you'd like to dip back and almost watch the series as a pre uh, a prequel series because it essentially was it it you know it it isn't like the movie was made and you could put it in the middle of the television series it happened after the series right. um, but yeah it's it's great and I and I can't I can't recommend it high enough I really I really appreciated the the way that the tempo of the show 
I think really played well. And especially being a television show and a British television show, it didn't have a ton of money. And man, they really, from a production value standpoint, I think they spent their money quite well. And I mean, it's it's a well shot television series. You know, that makes sense because it, the movie didn't strike me as something that had like a huge budget, you know? Yep. And I, yep. I feel like they were able to do a lot with whatever they had because it, it you know, the scope of it felt pretty big, even though it sort of had that same level of production quality as like a, a you know, like a Sherlock or something like that, where it's exactly. not quite a feature yes. film, but it's it's better than regular cable, you know? Well, yeah, that's, yeah, like I said, what the, you know, how they shot it made up for whatever lack of being able to go beyond, you know, the London locations that, that they were stuck in. But the guy who played... Martin Luther King in um, that movie that uh, was oh, nominated. Oh, uh, I mean, Selma. Selma. Uh, yeah. Oh gosh, what is that actor? David and I forget it's an African name. Oh yeah, name. like O oh, O oh, O oh, Yalue or oh, something along those lines. Yes, yes. He he is one of the original three. Oh, excellent. Um, and Keely Smith, who was um, uh, Jason Statham's wife, and she's in the bank job. And his, his oh, yeah. interest in bank job. She was one of the original agents. Okay. And then Matthew McFadden, uh, who's in uh, Ripper Street on uh, BBC oh, America. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he, the, they were the original field agents, and they were incredible. Oh, awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. No, I, I can't recommend uh, MI5 or Spooks enough. I, I think it's a, I, I really do think it's an exceptional show. And yeah, I was thrilled when it was on Netflix and sad when they took it off. Yeah, but, I got to uh, dig that one up. That sounds right up my alley, especially because totally I enjoyed the movie so much. You know, that movie's one that I'll, I'll just put on in the background and just kind of work to it and, you know, stop and look up at the cool parts and, you know. They have a, actually, whoever does the music score, I'm a big fan of as well because, yeah, the, and again, the TV show has those same people. That's the thing, like, all the people that worked on the TV show, the writers and their director and stuff, they had all worked before on the on the show. And it just it got it was so thrilling. And again, I think it had a release in in England a good year or two before we finally got the movie domestically. And uh, oh man, I was just so excited. I'm like, oh, I can't wait till this thing comes on, you know, DVD or whatever. And I was so happy last year when it finally came out. It's uh, no, it's it's can't recommend it enough. And I uh, and again, that's why I'm interested. So what other what other kind of spy? you know, intrigue stuff, uh, you know, film or television, were you a fan of? Oh, man. Well, you know, stuff along those lines um, that are, you know, maybe not like a series necessarily, but movies like Safe House, you know, with Denzel yeah. Washington and Ryan Reynolds. Um, sure. Anytime something like that comes out, I just eat it up, man. And, you know, Jaeger is also a revenge story, so there's a lot of stuff that, that you know, um, inspired that that aspect of it too um i love i love movies and stories where it's like you know the the character just wanted to be left alone you know or or they were double crossed and then they're out for revenge when you know the john wick john wick i mean absolutely man i cry like a baby <laughs> you know i the the beginning of that movie with the puppy i i, I was fine until i uh, until i got a dog and then i just <laughs> it kills me every time but uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, Taken. Taken was a huge influence sure. on on Jaeger because that movie moves at such a clip, and yep. there's not a wasted line of dialogue or screen time, you know, second at all. I mean, everything serves sure. to move the story forward, and you're with Liam Neeson's character virtually the whole time. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, God, I love that. You know, the the second and third were left much to be desired. Although two wasn't as bad as people made it sound like by the time I saw it, but. He's having a better like Bronson career than Charles Bronson did. And <laughs> yeah. I love I love how he's become this senior citizen action hero yeah. because he's such a great actor and he elevates the material. Yeah. Did you see uh, A Walk Among the Tombstones? Yes, I did. I love that. I that actually got good. me into the Scudder books uh, a little bit there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, there's there's kind of a detective element to Jaeger as well, which is heavily influenced by that kind of stuff. I mean, I love. Very. Yeah, you know, when you're when you're watching somebody put together the pieces and and you know uh, come to the conclusion that they're after, it's just so satisfying in storytelling. I agree. You know, what do you think of the Reacher uh, when when because uh, I've never read the books. I'm aware of the books, mm -hmm. and I can appreciate hardcore fans because Jack Reacher is supposed to be basketball tall. And that's a real big plot point in the, in the, in the stories 
where he's constantly like you know bending over for doorways or somebody going a stretch or something like that. To uh, him. And and he got five foot three Tom Hank, you know Tom Tom Cruise rather playing uh, Jack Reacher. Well, you know Tom Tom Cruise's character is about six or his uh, personality is about six foot seven, right? So that's yeah. true. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I don't know if it's ego, but it is. The way that, that, that people shoot him, and I don't know, the, the, the films he accepts. What do you think of his Mission, Mission Impossible movies? I love those, man. I mean, they're, they're getting a little ridiculous. I actually just watched uh, Rogue Nation a couple nights ago for the first time. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting to watch the trajectory of those, right? Because the first one was, was a little bit smaller and a little bit more, um, you know, it wasn't quite self-aware yet. It wasn't Mission Impossible yet, Agreed. you know? Agree. Um, two, I think, is the one that everybody kind of forgets about. It wasn't a bad movie to my recollection, but... I'll say it's a bad okay. movie. I thought it was a... Well, you know, it, maybe the fact that I, I don't remember anything about it other than him on that, you know, canyon motorcycle. face and the motorcycle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I I think that one maybe felt a little more James bond light than than the other ones that's did. Fair. So maybe that, yeah, you know, fair. was kind of out of step with the others, but... MI3 is fantastic. I mean, yeah, JJ Abrams right at the ship. Yeah. That's kind of his job and uh that's that's his job in genres. Yeah. We got to fix his genre. Send in JJ <laughs> Abrams, yeah. please. Yeah, man. And I mean, you know, <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman was just mesmerizing in that movie. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie Carrie Russell was great in that in the, you know, first half yeah. hour that she's in the movie and stuff. It's like, damn, Felicity's even like a badass super spy. Yeah, and you know, another <laughs> thing I like about those movies is I don't really feel like that the the female characters exist to be the love interest as much, you know, maybe a little bit in the last one, but like Carrie Russell was, was a, like a coworker, essentially. She was another, yes. you know, oh, totally. and it wasn't, I think it would have cheapened it if it was like his love interest and he was trying to save her. I, I, it was, I you know, the, the Michelle, Mon Michelle Monaghan, is that her name? The actress, yes. uh -huh. you know, her being the, you know, his girlfriend or wife or whatever, and, you know, not knowing what he does type of thing. Like, that added another dimension to the movie on top of the, you know, trying to save the friend and all that. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I thought Maggie Q was great in that movie. I was surprised they didn't put her in any more of them. I, I wonder if that was a, you know, Nikita, that's another one I haven't dived into yet. Is that, is that have you seen that one? You know, I haven't. I have to confess. And uh, no, and then even... Uh, the television show I heard was actually excellent as well. Yeah, that's you know that both of them actually there were two different TV oh, shows. Oh, that's right. She was kind of the second iteration of it, wasn't she? Um, I think so. Yeah, that's God. There's so much good stuff out there, man. I was like, I, oh yeah, you no, you, you you can't watch everything. I totally understand, but uh, no, that's uh, that's very funny. And yeah, I you know you're right. And I and I think from three on the the Mission Impossible movies found themselves. And it's interesting because I love, as a kid, I loved the original series. And I still kind of, it's sad actually where we're talking, Stephen Hill, who was the original, before Mr. Phelps and Peter Graves on the original Mission, Mission Impossible show, uh, Stephen Hill was the leader in the first season. And he was Jewish and was very uh, serious about his religion and refused to shoot on, on Fridays ah. uh, because of religious reasons. And, you know, that didn't play well on television studios, in, you know, at Universal sure. back then. And they were they were pretty hard. Or I, I can't remember if it was Paramount or Universal. I think it was Paramount. And, yeah, they, they fired him after the first season. And, well, you know, he kind of got pegged as a difficult actor. Luckily, his talent you know, <laughs> won out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, had such a very interesting career. And certainly in his uh, senior years, my God, from the 80s on. And he took 10 years off from acting, which I always found interesting. But uh, he he uh, he was the first uh, spy leader before Peter Graves. You know, on, uh, on Mission Impossible. That show was another one that I think was probably on Nick at Night when I was a kid. Sure. And I used to eat that stuff up, man. You know, when you're when you're at a point in in your awareness of the world and of media where you can't discern between the age of something. You know, it it, it didn't look dated to me as a kid because I didn't know any better and. Well, that's good. Yeah, and that's the stuff that's easiest to go back to and, and you know, rewatch. Um, True. And it's so funny, too, how, for me, you know, I was born in 85. I don't know if this is true of other people my age, but but Mission Impossible was just kind of in, in my general awareness as, you know, if you're a kid playing, on, you know, outside with your friends and you're sneaking around, you're doing the, the song, you know, the theme song. And, <laughs> sure. And the whole this message will self-destruct was was very ingrained in my, you know, sort of. Yeah, that was excellent. Yeah. 
yeah, no, that, that's you know that kind of stuff. Man, I you know I think they found a cool way to do those in the movies too, which has been a lot of fun. Um, what's I just watched another one that I was really digging that was um, kind of a spy thing. Oh, but you know it's another one actually that kind of fits along the lines of the you know best I am at what I do, but what I do is a very nice thing is uh, the Equalizer, which was a show, right? Loved that show. Yeah. Well, and again, he had he had the secret agent past. Yeah. And, you know, I want to get season three in particular because I want to get those episodes where poor Edward Woodward actually had a heart attack oh, and wow. couldn't do the show mid-season. And so they, they created a storyline where Robert Mitchum, 80, you know, like close to 80-year-old <laughs> Robert Mitchum, Hollywood, you know, noir bad boy, yeah. is a former agent friend and is brought in to solve the case. And it's like four episodes or three episodes or whatever. And it's great because Robert Mitchum, even kind of like John Wayne in his senior years, was still such a giant, intimidating looking guy. Yeah. And it worked. And it's, I love it because, you know, there's a, there's a great Robert Mitchum movie from the 70s that I've talked bef about before on, on Word Balloon called The Yakuza. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's great in that. And I really do believe visually it really has a very comic book look to it. And uh, that's, you know, I I kind of thought uh, when he stepped in for this equal, equalizer role, he was kind of channeling uh, things like uh, his his character in the Yakuza when he was doing it. And uh, yeah, I know. I, I mean, I loved Edward Woodward. And, you know, there's a great 60s um, British spy show that he did called Callan. C A L L A N. And Greg Ruck and I have talked about this before. And it's a great, uh, very, you know, stripped down uh, uh, spy that has some issues, some, some uh, post traumatic stress, as you, as you said too, about Jaeger and stuff. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it comes through in the portrayal. And there's even a Callan movie that's really good. And it is, it's that, it's that Le Carre and, and also uh, another television show, The, the Sandbaggers. Is, is a great show that it really is like kind of the realities of espionage. And it, it's that, uh, yeah, like I started to say, that John le Carré kind of style where it's not the, the gentleman spy in the tuxedo. As much as I love that, sure. show, it really is the working class spy that uh, really gets affected by his, his, uh, his work and also is, you know, kind of a middle class spy where, no, he's, he's not flying first class and, you know, is, uh, is roughing it. And it's uh, it's it's really his portrayals are good. And I really felt, again, that you could almost say that uh, his character in The Equalizer was almost Callan like 20 years later. Well, you know, speaking of John Le Carre, did you see the Night Manager miniseries from AMC? No, you know, a, a work friend was telling me about it again today. And I really do have to see it. I've heard nothing but great things. I think you would love it, man. It's it was really great. You know. Hiddleston, a lot of people have thrown his name out for Bond. And, yes. you know, I don't know that, I mean, he... I agree with you, yeah. by the way. Go ahead. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if he, he doesn't strike me as Bond. Daniel Craig, when, he, when I heard that he was cast, I loved Lair Cake. Yes, and I'm like, this yes, is going to yeah. be great. Yeah, and, you know, I like Hiddleston a lot. I think he's a fantastic actor. I don't, I don't really see him in the role. I thought he was great for the night manager as, you know, he's... His character starts off as a night manager in a hotel in in Egypt during the the Arab Spring, and oh, wow. yeah, and he kind of gets you know involved in this web of you know circumstance, yeah, and and uh, okay. it's it's really good, man. And Hugh Laurie is just fantastic in it. Well, that's what I had heard as well. And of course, Hugh. By the way, Hugh Laurie is in MI5 in the early seasons. Oh, really? As kind of an MI6 rival who doesn't particularly like the service. Because MI6 was more the international right. uh, branch, and, and MI5 is the domestic branch of, of British intelligence. And yeah, he it's the the politics between the two comes through. And yeah, Hugh Laurie has this great little recurring role, and is a real kind of jerk to the MI5 people. <laughs> oh, I love it, and is quite 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 suited for it. Hugh Laurie is is so great at being the really likable jerk and stuff. Yep. Um, like on <laughs> if you watch Veep, like he kind of has some you oh, know. Yeah. Now, okay, speaking of the rivalry between MI5 and MI6, what did you think of Spectre? Um, I got to be – I mean, it's funny. I watched it twice. I liked it a little bit better on the second yep. viewing. Um, I really think they had, a, again, a missed opportunity with Christoph Waltz. Yes, I agree. You know, there was – when when my fiancé and I went and saw it in the theater and when we left, um, 
we were both kind of like, well, you know, I wanted to like it more than I did, but I had the same experience when I, when I got the Blu-ray and watched it for the second time. Um, I had also rewatched all of the uh, movies, I think, at that point. So, you know, th- the way that it went back to formula, I, I found that I really appreciated it in, in sort of a juxtaposition to the first three Craig movies, um, you, which were much more of kind of like, you know, Bond Begins slash, you know, the Bond Night Rises or whatever, you know, <laughs> a little more. Yeah, like, no, you're right. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, there was that, that scene and, you know, the classic torture chair Bond villain scene. And Christoph Waltz is, is supposed to be this scary, menacing Blofeld. You know, I know he's not supposed to be physically intimidating, but just because his reach is so vast. But, right. he look, you know, he's sitting there with these, like, kind of slacks on that go up kind of high, and he's wearing loafers <laughs> with no socks. And he looked to me like a dentist who was, like, doing a filling for a friend as a favor on his day off, you know? <laughs> And it just didn't really resonate as something to be, like, scared for, you know, for Bond in that situation. But, um, you know, I, I really loved the, the the flavor of, you know, a little bit of Honor Majesty's Secret Service in there. Yes. Uh, a little bit of uh, From Russia With Love with the train fight scene. And, you know, of course, the, the tux that he's wearing and all that. And sure. um, Batista was a great uh, Bond kind of odd job and uh, read... Uh... Oh yeah, what Red Grant. Name? Yeah, yeah, Red Grant. I mean, yeah. So, and I mean, that's the thing. I'm like, God damn, Chris Batista, two in a row, Guardians yeah. and Inspector. Yeah, he's doing good. Yeah, I, or Dave Batista, Dave Batista, right? Yeah, yeah. No, he, I said Chris, he was yeah. fantastic in that. Um, just you know, I I loved the, uh, you know, the the sort of uh, Jaws esque weird fingernail yes. things. Like you know, it, it was weird, <laughs> but I'll take it. Like. Um, I, you know, the, uh, the car chase in that wasn't as dynamic as the one in quantum of solace, but I, I enjoyed it. I, you know, if anything for the, that, what is that? The DB 10 in that one is just such a beautiful yes. car. <laughs> oh yeah. But no. And you know, and I also liked, as you said, I mean, um, I liked Q, I liked Q's bit of business. I liked money Penny's bit of business, uh, M's bit of business. I mean, they all seem to have more to do. Yeah. And the film and that was and i enjoy i like that aspect of it but yeah i just felt really um for building a blofeld and the fact that we were getting blofeld back it was a little disappointing yeah i think i think they relied a little bit too much on you know hey remember this remember that from that one right you know um, that's been my argument with uh you know sometimes especially with the second uh jj abrams star trek mm-hmm. movie yeah i think i thought you know yeah it's like okay yeah we get it relax yeah. you know tell Tell your own story, and that's why I liked uh, Beyond a bit better than uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah, yeah, Into so. Darkness. Was, okay, we saw it. We saw that one. You know, <laughs> exactly. Well, and also, I mean, God, I've said it a million times. I just really felt like Quinto and Pine. I don't know. I just uh, they they had a tall order in recreating the Shatner Nimoy dynamic that we literally experienced for over twenty years, thirty years, really. Right. Uh, so it was like when they would show up on screen together, it's like, yeah, I've, we've been in, I mean, especially me going back to, you know, watching the, you know, reruns in the early seventies and stuff. It's like, yeah, I've been on this ride with you guys. It's okay. Yeah. And these two guys, they're brand new. And it's like, Oh, we're lifelong friends. It's like, now you just met each other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not buying it. I gotta be honest. You know, it's interesting. Um, Chris Pine is such a fantastic character actor. And I think really underrated Agreed. as such. I mean, if you see stuff like, um, Smoke and Aces, where he's that weird redneck white supremacist, you know, bounty hunter. Totally forgot he's Smoke and Aces. Oh, he's well brilliant done. in that. And then there was a movie. Did you see? I think it was called The Limo Driver, or the the what was it? It was Patrick Wilson, the guy who played Night Night Owl. Um, yes. I, God, what was this movie called? It, he he was a, a a limo driver in Hollywood, and it, it's kind of a you know, it's like a crime movie where he, you know, ends up delivering a package to the wrong person or something like that and gets caught up in this situation. And uh, Chris Pine plays this eccentric millionaire uh, who he picks up somewhere in like the the Hollywood Hills. And, you know, he's just given like coordinates and he's standing there like, what the hell's going on? And Chris Pine's character skydives in and just shows up on a, you know, with a parachute strapped to him. And he's got this long hair and he's just he's like playing weird mind games with Patrick Wilson's character. It's, it's really, really funny. I'll have to look up the name of it and, and shoot you a message yeah. with it. It was, it was well, a great movie too. I think you'd like it a lot actually. 
Well, honestly, I keep hearing great things. My, uh, I, I just had a conversation with Matt Singer, the film critic, mm -hmm. and he was telling me about Hell or High Water. And everything I'm hearing about this brand new movie is how great it yeah. is. And it's him, Ben Foster, and um, uh, Bridges, uh, Jeff Bridges. Yes. And, you know, modern Western. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're all like, oh, my God. And it's like, you know, Chris Pine is really acting, you know, his ass off and is so much more compelling in a movie like this than when, you know, he's got to pretend to be Captain Kirk. Or, or Jack and, Ryan speaking, of, you know. You know, I didn't, I, didn't see, I didn't see his Jack Ryan. Did you hear the news that um, I think Amazon is developing a new Jack Ryan uh, series? Oh, really? Television series, yeah. I'm, I'll, pretty, I'll give pretty it a sure. shot, yeah. Yeah, so will I. I'm, I'm interested to see what they're going to do with it. But yeah, I had heard that, uh, that Amazon is, uh, is going to be doing this. So that'll be, and that and also uh, Departed. He's gonna. They're gonna be. Uh, they're gonna turn the Departed into a television oh, series. Oh, really? It's. It's not the same story, and it's a. It's a. It's a different story with that Donnie Brasco dynamic of putting a putting a cop in a, in a criminal group. Okay. And it, it's supposed to actually take place in Chicago, and it's supposed to be uh, gangs. Oh, very street cool. Gangs. Yeah, because you know. So yeah, that should be interesting. When they there's there's been a lot, and you know they've been doing this for years, but I feel like recently there's been a big surge of, uh, you know, buddy cop movies turn into tv shows and other movies you know like you have um they're doing that training day series yes and lethal weapon lethal is coming weapon. out this fall they tried Fox. rush hour i don't think that went very long <laughs> nope nope so yeah i'm i'm curious to see you know some of these i think are better served in a in a serialized format like that um so it'd be interesting to see i'm curious about this jack ryan one that movie was not i don't think i even finished watching it honestly you know Ah. Chris Pine is great, but it just the movie was kind of bad. And uh, okay, I didn't mind uh, Affleck when he played Jack Ryan. Some of all fears. Yeah, that was a good one. I liked yeah. it actually. You know, well, I know that got kind of shit on, and I was like, oh, I'm I'm cool with it. I thought it was pretty good. I mean, you know, I I, I think Alec Baldwin and Harrison Ford played him the best. Oh, but, I forgot you know. that Alec Baldwin was Jack Ryan. Yeah, Hunt for Red October. That's yeah. right. I you know because Hunt for Red October is feels so much like its own movie you know like Fair enough. It, sure. I, I just think of it as the hunt for Red october that's funny no yeah and you're right about that and i and it well and it's just as much about connery's character as it is a, a jack ryan movie yeah and and it is easy to forget because harrison made did he make three or two he only made two right well patriot games and clear and present, present danger i believe those are the yeah unless there's a third one that's escaping me but yeah yeah i don't think so i don't think so and again he was you know, he well, he was he he was older. I mean, I was going to say he felt older than Alec Baldwin's character, and he was older. Yeah. Than Alec's character. Now, speaking of legacy characters, is there? Do you have a, a front runner in your mind for the next Bond? You know, I really want it to be Idris Elba. Yeah, me too. Man. I, I think he is so cool and and so perfect, and that's the kind of reboot that because um, you know, that's obviously in comics. I'm sure you're aware of it too. That's a big debate that goes on and stuff like that about reboots and, you know, do we go to the extreme of, of taking what was always a white character, turning him into a different character. James Bond can be anyone. And I think you prove that. And also, but it has to be a very special kind of actor. And I think the man has so much charisma and can pull off the action, can pull off the class. I agree. And it's just like, you got to do it. I mean, it's because also I think it, the unexplored dimension of Bond and here, boy, now we're getting into uber geek Bond stuff, but I know you'll oh, be with me. I'm, I got my oxygen tank, man. <laughs> we're diving deep. Let's do it. <laughs> At the beginning of um, For Your Eyes Only, the, the pre credit sequence where Roger Moore visits Teresa Bond's grave, mm -hmm. you know, that really does say, no, this you've been watching the same character from the start. Right. It's one guy. And, and I, on the one hand, I appreciate that. But on the other hand, I think especially in terms of James Bond, it can only work if that's a code name. Because it really doesn't make sense that this secret agent is so internationally known <laughs> and renowned. It just doesn't make sense. Right. Well, so, so I think it would be fun for it to be, all we know is there's some guy out there that's going by the name of James Bond. And I think it just makes it that tougher for the bad guys to know who he might be. Yeah. So you go on, you know, I mean, so there's that that dichotomy that frustrates me. And I, that's why I'd like to see it be no more of a code name, because also they're missing that great opportunity of 
whoever the current Bond is to be captured. And then, you know, Pierce Brosnan or, or, or uh, you know, got Timothy. Timothy Dalton, as he gets older, looks and feels more like James Bond. And I kind of wish he would come back and do a new movie. I said that same thing the other day. That's so funny. And, you know, he's he's the most, uh, you know, if you go by the way Fleming described Bond and, you know, how he said he kind of pictured him as like a hoagie Carmichael type. I, yes. I feel like uh, Timothy Dalton looks the most like what Fleming intended James Bond to be. I think that's fair. I think that's very fair. So who's your who's your choice? Well, you know, I'm I'm firmly in the Idris Elba camp myself. I, I know that's kind of the cliche thing, but you know, he's just such a, a great actor. And I mean, I'm sure you've watched Luther. Of course, I, mean, I love. Yeah, Luther. he just uh, the guy. You know, really transforms for roles. I feel like, and um, you know, I think. I think the biggest thing standing in the way of having him is that, you know, I think he's the same age as Daniel Craig at this point. Um, so, yeah, I think they're, I want to say they're both around 45-ish. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I'll even take, give me one Idris Elba movie as Bond, you know, because I, 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 yeah. I think it, I also like it in the idea that, you know, I, I think when they were making him the same guy over and over again, when Timothy Dalton was like, I had a wife once, you know, <laughs> and we're supposed to think. Right. To, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah good call. I, I think I think it works as it's, you know, a kind of sort of, I don't know, not an anthology, but, you know, just sort of like he's the same guy. But, you know, the timeline is wonky. We're not really oh, sure. adhering to the decades or whatever. Um, well, the fact that um, Judy Dench is right. for three bonds and really ends, you know, her career kind of wrapping back to the beginning. Right. And suddenly, you know, uh, Ray, Ray Fine is, uh, is Bernard Lee. Right. <laughs> you no. Know, so, yeah. Well, and you know, the, the casino Royale, I mean, we see him get his double O status, right? So that, right. that was very firmly a, a relaunch or reboot. And I think they could do that again. I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like Spectre, even if it didn't tie the prettiest bow, it, it definitely, you know, tried to close the loop on the whole thing. If I, I think Craig was ready to be done at that point and they were like, all right, well, we'll make it so that you can get out if you want to. And, you know, if he did want to come back, they could always do an on Her Majesty's Secret Service thing where something happens to, uh, I can't remember the character's name, but, you know, uh, Mr. White's daughter who he ends up with at the end of the movie. But, um, you know, another actor I really like for it is, uh, I, I always butcher his name, but Chiwetel Ejiofor. Sure. I think Love that yeah, guy. I think he'd be a great Bond. He's got the... I think you're right. I never thought of that beyond, beyond Idris as far as other black actors, but you're 100% right. He is wonderful. Yeah, he's got the, the you know, the very suave nature about him. Yes. I don't know how old he is, but I think, you know, he looks young enough they could pull it off for a couple of movies. No, that's true. Would you have thought Clive Owen would have made oh, a good Bond? In, in... Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. And also another one that I didn't know about until, and I think it, it wasn't it around the time of Dalton that they were considering Sam Neill. Oh, I didn't know that one. There's, there are rushes of Sam Neill, uh, auditioning for bond. Really? And, uh, and they're on one of the making of bond films. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I, and I'm almost certain it was probably around living daylights and yeah, I think Sam Neill would have been an excellent Bond. He would, yeah. And when you know who else was up for it around the time of Casino Royale was Henry Cavill. I always forget that they had mentioned Henry Cavill. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah, I think he would have worked. Yeah, I think physically at least, and I and I think he's you know he's and he's a charismatic guy. Yeah, and that was the nice thing about Man from Uncle is we actually got to see the level of charm and charisma that he he can bring to the Fair screen. Enough. You know, sure. um, I think it. I think now, you know, I would. I think he's a little too big. I'm sure he could probably trim down a little bit to be Bond, but you know, just the a Bond with a Superman physique doesn't necessarily feel right to me, you know. But yeah, but you know, again, Connery was a big giant. I mean, you you see it in in uh, You Only Live Twice and another, or rather, uh, From Russia with Love, and also uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Even as he's getting kind of old and creaky and stuff, it's like, yeah, that guy's still a skyscraper yeah. of a guy, and I, you know, I mean. He, he would have been a fine Scottish Superman. Now, this is where I get provincial. I want Bond to always be British. Oh, I agree And I don't know if... Yeah. I mean, that is the that that is the one thing. And I really... I don't want an American Bond. I really, really don't want an American now, Bond. Now, when we say British, I'll take Welsh, you know? I'll take... Yes. Oh, any, <laughs> any, any UK... Yeah. Um, and, and I would include even, as, as it happened with 
uh, George Lazenby, I'm cool. And again, I think also, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, Sam Neill. Yeah. I would be happy with an Australian doing yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's got to be of, of the, you know, yeah, of the United Kingdom. Well, and you know, uh, <laughs> another actor, really like uh, Clive Owen, definitely, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, he was the guy for sure. Yes. Um, uh, Matthew Good is another way. He might be a little too pretty, but I think he is a a. I gotta look up Matthew Good. He was Go Ozymandias in Watchmen. Oh sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, he's got the yeah, yeah. you know black hair, blue eyes. You know, the kind of smooth British guy. Yeah, thing. I can see him. Be, and and really, as a younger Bond, certainly. Yeah, but you know, another he's guy. Thirty eight right now. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So that's not. I think I think Craig was mid thirties when he. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. But another guy, like, did you see the guest? No. Dan Stevens is the star of that one, and I'm trying to think what else he's in. He's going to be in that new Legion FX show that's based on the you know X Men stuff. Um, oh, I see him, and I've, I recognize him, and of course he was in Downton Abbey. Oh, that's right, yeah. So um, he he read an audio version of Casino Royale that I listened oh, wow. to, and he was really great. And I think you know uh, the guest. You should check that one out, man. It's a pretty crazy movie. Have you? Has anyone okay uh, pushed you in that direction yet, or? No, not the first time hearing of it. The general premise, without giving it away, is that a uh, a family, a grieving family of a, a soldier who died in Iraq, uh, is surprised by a visitor who was in their son's, you know, battalion or regiment or whatever. Okay. Um, and you know, they sort of see him as the surrogate to kind of fill the hole of their their grief, and he ends up being not what they anticipate. And it's it's a really cool kind of smaller i think it was an independent movie and it it kind of has a um i don't know it's got a really really cool feel to it and it's got some you know actors that you recognize from stuff and and uh it's it's really great man i I believe it's still on netflix and it's totally worth a watch and he's okay he's super captivating in it he plays an american in the movie but he is you know british obviously um but i think i think he'd be a great pick he was in, of course, okay. uh, Walk Among the Tombstones as well. He was the guy whose wife was murdered that he calls upon Liam Neeson's character. I'm forgetting. I forgot about that as well. Yeah. You know, you're right. I, yeah, yeah. And a guy that they did mention possibly is, oh, maybe he'd be good. I, I'm like, no, thank you. And that's R- Eddie Redmayne. And I just, I, I, you know, I'm oh, sorry. Nah. I just think he's got the, yeah, I yeah. just think he's got the wrong look. Yeah, he's not, he, he looks like uh, a strong wind might carry him away. I don't. <laughs> I was going to say, exactly, that's the thing, you're right. I mean, I was going to say, he looks too frail to be James Bond. Yeah. It's like, and they really, when someone's like, ready, 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 I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. You know, you know who's <laughs> another one I like uh, is, uh, well, you know, he was in, what was that movie with uh, Matt Damon and... Um, Angelina Jolie, The Good Shepherd, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's Henry Redmayne. Yeah, he yeah, played absolutely. the son in that, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was my first exposure to him, and I forever see him as this kind of young, doe-eyed, you know. Like, I completely no, I completely agree, and that's the thing. It's like no, that's the spy that dies in the first. Yeah, act, man. yeah, exactly. He's he's the <laughs> he's the 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 guy in um, the spy who loved me, who wakes up on the other side of the 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 Russian female spy. You know, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> another guy I, I saw recently in a couple of things that I liked that who who might be good for it is um, Luke Evans. I think his name is. Um, Look, he was go ahead. he was in one of the Fast and the Furious movies as the bad guy Shaw, um, and he played. Now, I have to confess, I have not been watching the Fast and Furious movies. Well, but, you're but... you know they're. <laughs> oh, there! I know Luke Evans. Sure, I'm looking at a picture of him now. Again, 37 years old. Yeah, I think he he could be a good a good Bond. Um, yeah, those Fast and the Furious movies, man. Those, those, they've they've kind of you know jumped the the shark into being these sort of intrigue, international traveling heist movies. You know, it's yeah, it's funny cool. that, and I talk about this a lot, but the the first one was very much just Point Break with cars, right? Right. And then yeah, carjacking exactly, and yeah, yeah, and then you know the whole like take the keys and go type of thing, you know, and. And then the the second one was whatever it was, and the third one was was that you know save the last dance kind of movie where it's like the 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 kid, you know the kid has to go live with their estranged father with a bunch of kids of a different ethnicity, and you know they do a version of what those other kids do, and they're gonna you know be the fish out of water and learn how to do it and best all of the colored children at it, you know. But the, and there's always that dad who's like oh. You know, you can. I gotta go to the store in the morning. For now, you can sleep here. I'll take the couch. I don't know how to be a dad. Towels are in the closet. You know. 
<laughs> but certain formulas, man, I just, they, you know, they always work for me. So it doesn't take much to make me happy. And that's, a, that's another thing. I, I think I'm just easy to please in a lot of ways. So. Oh, no, that's, hey, man, we all got our own uh, guilty pleasures and just meat and potatoes things. There's, there's a ton of direct to video action movies that um, I've just got a group of friends and that's what we seek out. Yeah. And, and they're horrible and they never would have made it as theater movies and stuff, but they have their own appeal. And it's, uh, God, those. Um, Are we talking like the John Cena type of. Almost. Yeah. yeah. Now, for, yeah, I kind of draw the line yeah. Yeah, at, at a lot of the wrestler as as actor. Sure. movies. But I but I, but yeah, we're, we're close to that kind of uh, area. And like, was it it wasn't kickboxer. It was I want to say undisputed that as you know, the first movie was a Walter Hill film. And it was Wesley Snipes against Ving Rhames, and it was Prison Boxing. That's right, yeah. And then the second and third ones were, you know, how they continue sequels that have nothing to do with the original right. movie. And I can't even remember. I know Michael Jai, Jai White was in the second movie of Undisputed, and he fought um, a Russian prison boxer. And then the third movie was about the Russian prison boxer. And I have to admit, the Undisputed movies are like that for me. You know, and especially being an old boxing fan. Michael Jai so. White is a guy who I think, I think if if he was if his star was rising now, he would be huge. I agree with I, you. I think I don't know if it was Hollywood racism or what, but he he was so underrated. I mean, yes, he, I just well, and so it's the the projects that he chose, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you never know what kind of circumstances might maybe you know maybe he's got a sick mom and he was like i guess i'll do this falcon rising movie you know but <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i mean but I, black dynamite is amazing what's that black dynamite oh, black dynamite is just unparalleled i mean it's oh i love that movie and yeah you know it was interesting too to see him i mean that's one of the cool things about christopher nolan is he brings in these actors i mean by the time he made the Dark Knight. Michael Jai White, Anthony Michael Hall, and Eric Roberts were not really picking up a lot of roles. I don't think. It's true. You know, this is true. And he sees something in these actors and gets these really great performances out of them, and it it right. kind of makes you go, "Oh, hey, you know, like I remember that guy." You know. Which, well, Eric Roberts was his own worst enemy, yeah. and I know that. I mean, that, that's and that is why he had to make those best of the best movies and stuff yeah. like that. But I mean, he. I mean, I remember when he came on the screen in Pope of Greenwich Village and Star Eighty and those kinds of films in the in the eighties. And I mean, you know, he he had it. I mean, he really had it. But he and Mickey Rourke, they were bad boys. Yeah. And, you know, they got they got blackballed for a while. Have you ever noticed that that Eric Roberts looks like a John Romita Jr. drawing come to life? <laughs> It's great. Like if you look up like a like a J or J R Magneto, it's like a dead. It's That's it's crazy. There. You're you're right though. Well, I always felt that Cavill, and now I'm blanking on the artist. It was uh, the Superman birthright artist. Oh, uh, Lineal U. Yeah, Lineal U. I think Henry Cavill looks like a Lineal U Superman. Yeah, yeah. Really does look like a Lineal U Superman. Yeah, that's funny. so. Yeah, I no, I know. He's, and you know, here I'll give you another one. Um, I was, uh, there was a soap opera, it ended, I think around 2010 called All My Children, mm -hmm. ABC Noontime soap opera. And there was a character on the, on the show named Tad Martin. And I can't remember the name of the actor who played Tad, but he looked like a John Romita senior, Peter Parker. Was he, he was one of the, the long time oh, yeah. characters, right? Oh yeah. He was, he was literally like in his mid, like he started as a teen character and was in his mid forties when when the show ended, and he was kind of pudgy and stuff. But you go back to when he played a teens and twenties, Tad Martin, Michael, and I forget what his his name might be, Michael Knight, and I, I'm gonna look him up. But uh, um, yeah, he he looked like a John. Oh Lewis. yeah, I can see that. I just looked him up. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. <laughs> good. You know, I'm not nuts. You though. know what's another one I noticed too is speaking of Lineal U, Kristen Stewart really looks like a Lineal U drawing. I'm looking up Kristen Stewart. From uh, the Twilight movies and stuff. Oh, uh, the girl, yeah, the woman, yeah. of course. I'm thinking of a man named Christian or something like, yeah, yeah, I can see. <laughs> That's always kind of a fun game to play, right? Like... <laughs> Absolutely. No, it is. It, yeah, it, it is. It's interesting. It's like that that these real people, because obviously they weren't, in, I mean, certainly in the case of Michael E. It's Michael E. Knight, I want to say is his name. He's couldn't, you know, I mean, that was 20 years after uh, John Romita was drawing Peter Parker and stuff like that. So uh, too funny. It always kind That's... of bums me out when you see uh, somebody who would have been the exact 
actor for a role at a different time and you're like, oh, I wish we could have that now, you know? Totally. Absolutely. That's funny. Very cool, man. Well, you're killing me. This was good. I <laughs> I enjoyed our podcast. Oh, definitely, man. That's, I've that's been uh, that's been happening on a lot of episodes of late. We start talking about something, and then we we spin off into uh, uh, some sort of geek thing that uh, you know you, the the guest and I both share, and we can we can uh, kind of go crazy on uh, and go deep on a, on a on a super spy kick. Yeah, like we've done. no, it's this has been a lot of fun, man. It's you know most conversations with me either go to Superman or Bond, so I'm I'm glad we were able to. <laughs> Next time we'll explore Superman oh, totally. because, I can, uh, you know, well, very quickly, who's your favorite Superman artist? Ooh, um, that's tough because I know the answer and I can't think of it right now. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, well, I'll give you my, I'm, I'm a Kurt Swan guy yeah. because I grew up. With him. Yeah, no, he's, he's definitely up there. I'm trying to think, you know, I, I definitely have different artists whose iteration of Superman I love. Like I think, uh, I think when he was on it in the 90s, Stuart Eminem was drawing a perfect Superman. Can't disagree. Yeah. And of course, it was Se- great. Secret Identity is is my favorite Superman book. I know it's, you know, elsewhere, like, but... Yeah, but I like that book. I like that book a lot, and I wish Busick had written a bit more Superman. He ended up doing it, you know, in that post-Infinite um, uh, Crisis world. Yeah. But I wish he had, I wish he had written him more. You know, another... Uh, I mean, Alex Ross is the whole reason I got into comics in the first place. Yeah, that does, he doesn't suck. Yeah. yeah. Does, you know. And that was, a, I love, and I love his kingdom come Superman yes. in particular. Yeah. Because he really does. I just love that slightly bowed, like has the weight, literally has the weight of the world on his shoulders. Look that he gives Superman. Yes. And I think that his Superman is a big reason why I have continued to love the character over the years. Because, you know, when I was a little kid, I was, oh, he flies and his costume's cool and he does the right thing all the time. And, you know, that a lot of that stuff is what people dislike about the character. So, yes. you know, I think, I think he portrays him in such a way that you really see the aspects that make him interesting just in the visual alone. You know, I always think back to that one image I, it's somewhere in Kingdom Come towards the end when they all go off to war and I think Wonder Woman kind of goes off on Superman and then they just leave him standing there in the watchtower. And I want to say that image is is the first thing you see when you open Kingdom Come and there's the dedication to Christopher Reeve in there. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of him standing almost in silhouette and, you know, just with this sort of, uh, you know, not to say, I don't want to say brooding, but kind of a brooding look to him, you know? Yes, and it's just this, yes. It's this perfect encapsulation of, you know, Superman is about to go do something that he knows he has to do, even though he might not want to do it. And I think that that is the thing that makes the character interesting for me is that he's he's obligated to do the right thing no matter what, even if that is, you know, to his own detriment or, you know, to his own inconvenience even. I mean, (laughs) can you imagine, you know? (laughs) Is only yeah, I mean, can, if you can ah, hear a mouse fine. fart from you know outer orbit, like that that that's a lot of responsibility, you know. <laughs> I hear you, man. No, that's that's literally one of the things I think they get right in Superman Returns, the Brandon Ralph movie, mm-hmm. and they have that one scene of him in outer space, just kind of trying to like either have a moment of peace, but then you know it allows his hearing to hear what's happening in the world, and he's got to act, and he does. Yeah, and I think that. I think a lot of that, and even a lot of Man of Steel, too, they mined from Secret Identity. I mean, you know, I feel like that was the first time... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because I was going to say Kingdom Come. I see a lot of <clears throat> Kingdom Come in their visual choices. Absolutely. I feel like I feel like uh, Secret Identity was the first time I really saw Superman just kind of doing the introspective, hanging out in space, looking down at the earth it it happens a couple times in that book and i remember it really struck me as like oh that you know and then and actually that uh that scene in superman returns where the camera starts to kind of pan around his cape and it blocks the the lens for a second yeah that is almost a direct lift from that superman peace on earth thing that uh alex ross and Baldini did sure um i remember seeing a lot of the like production art for Superman Returns, and somebody had essentially photoshopped the image of Superman over, uh, I think it's Rio de Janeiro, holding those big, you know, that big crate of food that he was taking down. 
Yes. And they kind of yes. reappropriated it and put him in space. And I remember thinking, like, that is what I wanted a Superman. Just give me, give me two hours of him floating in space, and I'm good. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I don't disagree with you. That's hilarious. Well, and that's why, from a writing standpoint, I understand the the writers who say I just don't get him. And it's like, fine. That's that's not a flaw in either the character or yourself. It's just a disconnect for you. That doesn't mean it's a bad character. And when readers who don't like Superman, well, he's, he's boring. It's like, no, you just don't, you don't connect with them, and that's fine. There's plenty of heroes that I don't connect with that are immensely popular. But you're right, Superman in the right hands, uh, Greg Rucka gets him. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Loeb got him when he got to write him and stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. There are there are writers that absolutely know how to write it. And I'm happy to say I do believe that uh, uh, both uh, uh, Dan Jurgens and uh, and Peter, and now I'm blanking. What's Peter's uh, last Tomasi. name? Yeah, Pete Tomasi, of course. Shame on me. Pete Greek. Another Greek. Like you are with Egyptians. I got to know my right? Greeks and everything. Yeah, no, they both – I think really what's happening right now with DC Rebirth with their with the pre-Flashpoint Superman, I'm glad that they have righted the ship because we really suffered through, I think, five years of really shitty Superman. You know, that the, that particular version, version didn't grab me either. No. And I, I – I love what's going on now. I was never a fan of the Superman has a kid type of twist. And that was one of the things I really, really detested about Superman Returns. Uh, but I think it's being done so well in Superman right now. Uh, and it I, it does something that I hadn't anticipated, which it, it really, or I rather I hadn't anticipated enjoying so much, was giving another dimension to the character. And, you know, now there's that interplay between him and his son and him and Lois and, and their son. And, you know, it, for people who's, Oh, it's life's too easy. Everything's too easy for him. Well, you know, now he's got a family and yep. that really adds another layer to the whole, you know, difficulty of being Superman. Um, and also, you know, I've, I've always been a huge fan. And I think most people are of the Jonathan Kent, Clark Kent relationship. And absolutely. Yeah. And to see him get to pass that on to, another character and, and be what his father was for him, especially when it, with regards to dealing with his powers, you know, and, and coming to yep. terms with how they work and everything. Um, I think it's great, man. I, and, and the art has been fantastic. I really, I feel like, uh, Gleason is not who a lot of people would typically cast as the artist for Superman. And I, I love everything about what he's doing. I think you're right. And, you know, the... Uh, Zercher, too. I like that Zercher's yeah. work, too. Yeah, and, you know, the, the, the guy who's been doing, like, the fill-ins or, you know, alternating with Gleason on Superman, uh, Jorge Jimenez, is... His his art is just flooring me right now. He's I like it. Yeah, I do. It's really great. That I think it was issue three where uh, the Eradicator shows up and they... Yes. Oh, that was just so beautifully drawn, man. I It had been a while since... I was able to go to the shop and pick up a Superman issue that I was really, really stoked for, you know? I agree with you. No, absolutely. And also, again, when I came to the character in the early 70s, Superman was a father figure. Mm -hmm. And was, like, I always, especially late Kurt Swan, I felt like he was drawing him as a 40-year-old man. Yeah. You know, and he just did seem like a more senior man. And it, it fit because he was the first hero. Right. And he, I mean, that's the thing, and that's where... I think this new 52 version, it just didn't work. There was, I, I keep talking about it, there was a series, a backup series in the 70s called Superman, The In-Between Years. And it was literally that time when uh, Clark was in college. Oh, and he wasn't Superboy any, He wasn't Superboy anymore, but he wasn't quite Superman, and he wasn't at the Daily Planet yet. And they were interesting stories. And that's a fine area to explore. And I even liked that they were exploring it with Morrison when the new 52 first started. But to stay there with the character, it's like, you know, no, I, I think he to be a leader, he needs to be a bit more seasoned. He needs he needs to be that first hero. And I think that's what he brings, the, what the character brings now. And even as the Justice League gets used to this new Superman right. and stuff, that they don't know, he's still coming with that experience. And, you know, I, I love that about uh, the Golden Age Superman when, when he still existed on Earth, too. And it was the best part of Infinite Crisis when uh, John's in the hands of Jeff Johns. He just knew when to do it. But when the Golden Age Superman met Earth-1 Batman 
and Earth One Batman is like, I don't know you. Right. And he's like, and, and and the Golden Age Superman's response was, no, but I know you, and you're the one man I can trust. Yeah. And it's like, yes, yeah. that's your Shatner Nimoy. That's your, like, no, I know the other guy doesn't know. I mean, it's it's when Nimoy touched Chris Pine, and it's like, I know you don't know who I am, but you are my friend, and you've been my friend forever. Hold on. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me catch you up. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's what's cool. Absolutely. You know? And I think that was one of the things that, that was so heartbreaking about Batman vs. Superman, too, was that, you know, yeah. You, the, I mean, the world's finest book that was coming out for a long, I guess it was just Superman, Batman for a while. You know, yeah. sorry, I think it started yeah, with that yeah, low run. It was the modern world's finest. I'm with yeah, you. I mean, that was my favorite book on the stands, man. I low? Yeah, it, Jeff- it was just, it was everything I wanted of those two guys teaming up and being buddies, you know, and solving problems together. <laughs> and still having differences because of the way they approach things. Right. And maybe not liking each other for those differences on the surface, but deep down it's like, no, this is the one man I can trust. That that epilogue in Kingdom Come. Uh yes. when they're at Planet Kingdom Come. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I I just talked to Wade about it again. And I just love when he's like, you know, uh, Superman's like, how's Luther? And he's like, oh, I caught him trying to hack into the yeah. back of you. <laughs> says, says hello. And there's that optimism of Superman. He's like, he did? Yeah, yeah. And versus, no. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's my favorite thing about their interplay together is that I feel like Batman reminds Superman of his naivety. And, you know, I guess, you know, I, his privilege to a degree. I mean, you know he's he's almost more human than batman in a lot of ways but batman is is such a um you know a pessimist in a lot of ways too that i think you know he kind of you know for lack of a better term grounds superman absolutely and i i think that that is uh that's something i always enjoy reading and you know the the aspect of superman that that people hate so much too the goody goody part of it that's always the part that i've really loved man i mean Part of it is, you know, growing up watching the Reeves Superman movies. Sure. He was, he was, you know, would you care to step outside? He's so polite to even the bad guy. Like, <laughs> and it's just, I mean, it really is a good example, you know, to, I mean, as a kid, like I, I really, I used to ask myself and still do like, what would Superman do? You know, I mean, there've been times where I've literally pulled over, you know, even if it wasn't convenient for me, cause somebody like needed their car pushed or a flat tire or whatever. And I just thought like, the right thing to do you know and and it's well, very much i think because of the appeal of that character to me that I, that kind of stuff kind of stuck with me as i grew up you know well and i think secretly bruce wayne and batman kind of wish that they don't wish for clark's naivete but they do wish for his optimism yeah and that and that he can see the world still as a beautiful place right. and that ended for him a long time ago and he can't be that person anymore and it's i think that it, i think there's a little bit of jealousy yeah, that, absolutely. That, that that Superman can still see the beauty in the world that Batman just can't see anymore. So yeah, no, and again, it is it's that difference that makes them interesting, and that wasn't there in the movie. And and it really, I I get I feel insulted when Snyder and his wife, uh, who's a producer on uh, both you know the Batman Superman movie and certainly uh, the Justice League yeah. movie. Oh, we get it. Fans don't want their heroes. Uh, 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 deconstructed. We understand. It's like, no, fuck you. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not the problem. You, you there's, and, and I'll be interested to see as they move forward. I don't know. I mean, I know they're moving forward with, with another Superman movie in addition to Justice League. I don't know if Snyder's going to be the director or not. I really hope he isn't because I just feel like after two movies, you just don't understand this character. Yeah, you know, and, and visually, he does some pretty Amazing. brilliant stuff Amazing. and it's such a weird sort of cognitive dissonance type of thing that happens, you know, when, yes. when you're watching it, you're going, Oh, and yeah, you know, I, I'm optimistic now with Jeff Johns in, in the new positions and, and, uh, you know, I think, I think they are hearing people loud and clear, hopefully. Um, and you know, at least we've got this, uh, this Supergirl season premiere coming up with Superman yep. in it. And, that guy looks great. I love that suit. I loved everything about it. And I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm optimistic that in uh, our lifetime we'll have something that, you know. <laughs> oh, oh no. They'll, eventually they'll get it right. And also, like you said, that Superman show, looking forward to seeing uh, the guy actually play him, that text conversation they had yeah. in the 
season. It's like he's not even on screen. It's literally just words, but it's like, oh, they're Superman. Yeah, they, they're the Superman that's we It's so know. funny that you mentioned that, John, because I and you know, this is where the Uber nerd comes out of me. I got chills watching that scene, man. Me too. I'm but I you know, I'm also a guy who loves Superman four unironically. <laughs> so Oh, dude, do you know how Art Balthazar? No, you know what? I, I remember them mentioning it on an episode you did with them, and I, I briefly stopped by their table at, like, Emerald City a couple years ago, I want to say, and and just let them know I was with them, both him and Franco. Yeah, because Artie and – I mean, Franco Franco's not as much as Art, but, yeah, Artie is happy to, as I'm sure Word Balloon listeners know, but if newbies don't know, is happy to, to – support at defend and and honor superman for story and he's like hey visually it sucks the canon guys it, you know yeah. bad effects nuclear man sucked the, uh, lenny luther all the nonsense but that aside in in there somewhere is a really good superman story and i agree with him selling the farm yeah is so sad. i mean the the whole thematic through line of that movie of letting go and and sort of moving on you know he's yes he's dealing with you know, he's got the last Kryptonian crystal that if he uses it, that's the last tie he has to his home world. He's got right. the farm that he's selling. And you get you get a really downplayed Clark Kent in this movie, which I really loved. I, you know, I love Superman the movie. Um, I, I do the, the Clark Kent was a little cartoony for my taste. Um, you know, a little too, well, gee, gee golly, gee willikers, you know, uh, I think that he, he played it so brilliantly in four, you know, he's still bumping his knee on, on tables as he walks by and, and, you know, he's having a hard time in, in the aerobics class at the gym, but he's not, you know, he's not like this Mr. Magoo cartoon of, you know, ineptitude. Um, no, and he's well, he's using his clumsiness to his you know advantage and stuff. Yeah. No, I agree with that, I agree that movie with you. has an interesting love triangle. You know, you've got yes, it Lacey does. Warfield <laughs> likes Clark Kent and couldn't give a shit about Superman, and Lois is the opposite, and he's kind of yep. trying to trying to you know figure both out and and you know again with the theme of letting go, the Daily Planet was sold to a, a an Inquirer type of tabloid and. Absolutely. Harry White is going down to the bank to get the loan to apparently you could do that in the, in the late eighties, buy a newspaper like, <laughs> from a loan, you know, from the bank, but from San Juan to make her. Exactly. No, that's no, I love it. And also, I, and really this is terrible. And I'm sure women are like yelling at me right now for saying it, but poor Margot Kidder. I mean, the cigarettes are just getting a little too much. And that's like her Lucille ball. Hi, Superman. I'm here for, a <laughs> but <laughs> you know, like, yeah, Conversely, that was her. I think her best turn is Lois Lane. Uh, oh, that's interesting. She, you know, there's a scene where you know after, after Superman is scratched by the silver acrylic fill and, uh, fingernails of uh, nuclear, nuclear man, man, you know he's <laughs> sick and he's feverish in the apartment, and Lois comes to him and she she has the cape that the the newspaper acquired and they were going to run it like a you know a sleazy kind of story and. And she's like, you have no right to this, you know, and she takes it and and she goes to Clark's apartment and gives it to him and basically says to him, like, I know you're Superman almost, you know, like if you see Superman or you hear from him, let him know that we miss him and we love him. And and, you know, and she's crying as she's saying this, but it's, That's it's true. very genuine. And man, and, you know, that that scene at the United Nations when Superman stands up and gives the speech about the Earth is my home, too, and. That gets me yes. every time, man. I it's like every time I watch that is like the first time I watched it. It's great. No, I understand. And it's too again, there's another story that you'd like to go back and in the right director's hands with the right budget and with better choices, maybe there's a there's a much better film in there. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a, a question Superman would have to ask himself in this day and age, right? You know, sure. I could rid the world of chemical weapons. Do I do that or is that interfering? And I think that that's much more interesting than you know, I'm going to blow off half the West Coast and claim the rest of it for myself, you know, um, <laughs> which is still a great plot. I don't mean to, you know, poo-poo on that. It's obviously Superman the movie is, you know, it's a... Oh, no, it's it's fun. And, oh, God, I mean, no, the legitimate comedy in the movie. Yeah. I, yeah, I just had this conversation online with some, with, uh, with a friend, and it's like, you know, I hate the Donner Superman movie. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, you got to understand, that was still, like, the hangover of the 66 Batman. And I think comic book films obviously have come a long way in, in, in the last 40 years, and thankfully. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's the thing is, no, they were still 
there, there were still the powers that be that are like, no, you got to do it this way because this is clearly the only the only way a mainstream audience will accept this. Right. And Donner was able to get a lot of humanity in that movie despite that wrapping of a, a, a schlocky, silly movie, but that has those real moments of humanity in it. And yeah, and it's the testament to the actors. And it, again, a Tom Mankiewicz, the guy who uh, took the Mario Puzo terrible script. You know, Jeff and I have talked about that. He's like, have you ever read it? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Mankiewicz, who also uh, wrote a bunch of the Bond movies. boy, I knew you'd know yep. that. There you go. <laughs> I know I haven't I haven't had the chance to meet Ben Mankiewicz yet, but I really would love to hear, you know, how much how well he knew his cousin, Tom, because they're all from the same Hollywood family. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I would really, I, I, that's a missed opportunity. And also, uh, Kyle uh, Higgins. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a really good friend of mine. And we, he's told me some stories of, you know, film school and, and, and uh, yeah, hanging out with him. And, and Don. yeah, cause he got to meet Donner too, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And I'm due to talk to him. I want to talk to him about his new astronaut book. Yeah. Hadrian's wall. It's really, really great. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. I, and I didn't know you were part of that click. Are you friends with Bucolato as well? No, you know, uh, Kyle and I uh, are collaborating on something. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. So we we've uh, we got pretty close, you know, just over the course of doing that. And uh, yeah, you know, as soon as he found out I was a Superman fan, he's like, well, you know. And <laughs> so. <laughs> Very cool, man. All right. Well, I've taken you two hours. You must have you probably tired and you want to have dinner or something for god's sake oh uh, you know <laughs> and get back to work or regardless well actually you're a thin you're a thin good looking guy so you probably have already eaten oh well, the thank you so, sir you're too kind <laughs> uh, sorry but no it's a uh, hey man real pleasure talking to you again this was great and i loved uh, the bond talk and i love the superman uh, talk well, but more importantly i love the jaeger talk because uh it deserves people's attention again it's on the uh it's uh st say say the name of the uh, app again stila Stila, thank you. So Stila, and again, how, how the best way to get the app? Uh, the uh, iOS App Store. Okay, yeah, that's right. So yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, right now only on uh, iPad and uh, and iPhones, but absolutely worth it. And it's a great story. Good uh, post World War II, Cold War intrigue, foreign intrigue at its best from Ibrahim Mustafa. I really appreciate the talk, man. Oh, thank and, you, John. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I uh, should mention too, the first chapter of that is free. Uh, for you know anyone with the app so um you know you can you can taste before you buy <laughs> oh that's great well there you go so even better so yeah there's uh no obligation to buy. yeah exactly <laughs> but uh, I, once you read the start you'll uh, you'll get sucked in much as we did with high crimes and uh, other great work from ibrahim mustafa so pleasure talking to you man stay in touch and uh when there's something new come back you bet john thanks so much man tremendously fun conversation with ibrahim mustafa to uh, wrap things up on today's Word Balloon. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, great stuff still to come uh, in the month of September. Uh, Labor Day weekend is coming up. I hope to have one more episode for you for the holiday weekend. But it was a pretty full week with uh, Emma Rios and Ibrahim. And, uh, but uh, there's one more conversation. In fact, I know I'm going to do it because uh, it, has, it impacts uh, what's coming up this weekend. New York is having a big Star Trek convention. And, uh, man, I'll tell you, me and IDW, we've been trying to uh, arrange a Star Trek conversation for a really long time. We managed to sneak it in right before the 50th anniversary. September 8th is the official date of the 50th anniversary. But uh, editor Sarah Gatos and uh, Star Trek uh, comic book writer Mike Johnson joined me for a conversation. Lots of fun. And they're going to be at the Star Trek convention in New York. Uh, I, I do suggest that you seek them out if you're going to the convention. Uh, if you haven't been reading the Star Trek comic books from IDW, you don't know what you're missing. My God. And every iteration of Star Trek. Uh, they have lately been focusing more on the original series and the uh, the Kelvin universe, the J.J. Abrams film universe. But uh, great announcements. Uh, Star Trek Waypoint is coming up, which is an anthology that's going to look at all uh, the different Star Trek iterations. And uh, looking forward to uh, that uh, anthology series. And plus... Uh, Star Trek Boldly Go is a chance for them to kind of reboot their Kelvin Universe coverage. And, uh, man, Mike even teases kind of the direction they're going in. Uh, so fans of the movie of Star Trek Beyond, I think, will be very happy about uh, where uh, the stories take place in the timeline of the Kelvin Universe. 
So I'll let Mike talk about that on the next episode of Word Balloon. Check it out. It should be coming out in a day or so. Definitely, again, before uh, the weekend hits. So thanks for listening to Word Balloon. If you've got any questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter, at John Word Balloon on uh, Facebook, or rather on Twitter. And then uh, on my uh, Facebook page, it's just my name, John Sontras. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, you know, I've been uh, doing these wrap-ups <laughs> when I'm at my most fuzziest brain-wise. So that's why I kind of uh, I lose my place sometimes and make stupid mistakes. So bear with me. Uh, the good news is the conversations, I'm razor sharp, hopefully. And uh, I hope you find those entertaining. So until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2016.